Roll call, please. Mr. Block? Here. Mr. Abramson? Here. Mrs. Brooks? Here. Mr. Bilek? Here. Dr. Foster? Here. Mr. Grupp? Present. Mrs. McKessie? Here. Mrs. Sexton? Present. Mrs. Thomas? Here. Mr. Klein, superintendent's report? Thank you, Mrs. Thomas. Um, looking for my superintendent's report, sorry. <laughs> I just want to announce that tomorrow night we're doing graduation for the class of 2014 and um, also that tomorrow is the last day of school for students, half day of school for all students. Um, tomorrow's graduations begin at 4 o'clock at Council Rock High School North and at 6.30 for Council Rock High School South. We typically will have Council Rock North's graduation outside of Walt Snyder Stadium. Folks, I'm telling you, don't count on that. I've looked at the weather forecast now a couple different times tonight. It looks like it's going to be raining for most of the day tomorrow. So we'll have to see if um, we're going to do that or not. We will have um, information on graduations, um, on the north graduation, whether we're indoors or outdoors, on the web by 12 o'clock noon tomorrow so people can make um, plans accordingly. Just a quick overview of the two classes that are graduating. I think this is always interesting. Between the two classes, 1,048 students will be graduating, 500 at North, 538 um, graduates at South, 1,046. If I said that wrong, I apologize. 94% um, of the students at Council Rock North will be moving on to college, 1% will enlist in the military. 97% of the class of 2014 will move on at South to college, 1% also will be enlisted in the military. Between those two classes, there was over 50,000 uh, hours of community service done over the four years. And the class of 2014 was offered over $20 million of scholarships, of which 9.3 million was accept were accepted by the two classes for colleges and universities that they chose to attend. They are an extraordinary group of kids, and we look forward to congratulating them tomorrow as they graduate for the class of 2014. Um, and just so we can end the school year with the beginnings, the first day of school for the 2014-15 school year. If you're a student, just close your ears. It'll happen uh, eventually, but you can enjoy your summer. Will be Tuesday, September 2nd for students in grades K to 6, 7 and 9. And then uh, all students will report on Wednesday, September 3rd, 2014. Thank you, Mrs. Thomas. Mark, if um, North is inside, which entrance should uh We'll have yes. all of that information, you know, noticing that I didn't even have a microphone. I apologize. <laughs> You're usually good about telling me that, Nance. I'm sorry. Um, we will make sure that all that information is on the web when we go forward. I'm just hopeful we don't have to, but if it is, explicit instructions about tickets and all of those things will be on the web tomorrow, and a listserv will go out for parents too. Thank you, Mrs. Thomas. No problem. We can move on to public comment. Is there anyone here tonight who wishes to make a public comment? Okay. So the public, I'm going to do a shortened version. Our public comment is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board. No one's making a public comment tonight. I'm not going to proceed with the rest. We have a quite packed agenda, so I'm going to move on if no one else. Okay. So moving on. Um, our first item is our much anticipated planning committee presentations. So I'd um, like to take a moment, if you'd indulge me, to remind everyone what the planning committee was charged with and um, what we're about to hear this evening as far as the results of, of what we asked them to do. This board came together and decided it would be a good idea to put together a committee made up of public members to take a look at our facilities and how we use them. And in that charge, we asked them to come back to us with a couple different options that we may review. The purpose of tonight is the result of a year of a great deal of work that committee members have done. I forget how many people were on the committee, about 40? 40. 42 originally. 42. Uh, members volunteered their time in hour-long meetings, um, several hours, and put together what we will hear tonight as options one, two, and three. Three different choices for the board to look at and the public to review. The purpose tonight is to let us hear them, 
they will uh, present to us. If there are some clarifying questions by members of the board, we will take some clarifying. I didn't understand if that was students or was that something else. Some clarifying questions. We'll take them um, as questions and answers. If there are more detailed questions about conclusions or more detailed information, we'll be scribing them down. There will also be an email address at planning at crsd.org to which anybody in the public may uh, write in a question or a thought. Those will be gathered for our entire board. And at our July meeting, we will discuss what our next steps will be. That's not to say, so you should not expect that this board will necessarily say, oh, we like option one, we're going to do that. It's more to just say, okay, this committee's worked for a year. They've worked hard to come up with some options for us. What is the process that we move forward and we start to begin to make decisions? I would expect that the July meeting, this board would come together and lay out their plan uh, for discussions as we go into the fall. Um, so I, I just wanted to go over that with everyone. If there's anybody on this board who wants to make a comment before the presentation start, um, but I believe that's what we had all discussed. Okay, so if we want to go ahead with the um, options that the committee came up with, are there PowerPoints? So we should. Is this the first one? Chris, is that yours? Good. So the first one is from Chris Dorius Group. Great. Uh, thank you. So my name is Chris Dioria. And Kevin Campbell. We have the pleasure to speak on behalf of our team with the proposal that we came up with or recommendation, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's been an interesting journey, a learning journey for all of us. So we, we learned a lot going through the, uh, the process, a lot of information here. The presentation is very, very high level. The document all of you members of the board have is much more detailed than you'll see. So we're just going to give you a high level overview of what it is. Our team has been great to work with, uh, very informative, passionate people who put in a lot of time and energy. So I thank each and every one of them. So this first slide here is a summary of the recommendations. So at a high level, what we're talking about is we would like to see all the trailers removed, uh, which we think we can done, done relatively quickly through better utilization and some possible minor student transfers between schools. Then we get into some more of the more controversial or challenging recommendations when you talk about uh, closing the school and, and moving students and redistricting. So looking at the school and the, uh, the school population and the demographics, we feel that one of the elementary schools of the 10 elementary schools probably is ready to come offline based on where our demographics are and looking at what we went through. We would say Wrightstown is the, the least impactful choice right now because it doesn't require a lot of capital investment to be able to close that school. Uh, the next recommendation would be looking at the middle schools renovate and potentially expand Holland Middle School with a cost of roughly $36 million, which is uh, far less than the cost to build a new middle school. Um, as, as you'll see a couple bullets below that, the next one is closing Richboro Middle School. So we have three middle schools that need a lot of work, capital infrastructure to bring them up to speed with respect to current codes and educational standards. The demographics don't support that we need all three middle schools. If you close one of those schools, you can put your money into two instead of three facilities get a little bit more efficient utilization, not have to spend as much capital and provide better facilities for all of your middle school age population going through the district. Um, as part of the Holland Middle School renovation and the Richborough Middle School, you'd look at redistricting um, the rest of the district. So the Wrightstown closure would say the northern end of the district, the uh, Holland Middle School Richborough renovation would look at the southern end of the district or more Northampton Township, if you will. Um, and then. Another controversial point is Newtown Middle School. It needs a lot of work. It's so much work, it's probably better and more efficient at the end of the day to build a new school rather than renovating that school, given how old it is in the current state of the facility. And then the last major recommendation would be looking at the demographics where we are. We don't see a need for the house track, that piece of property, so it's sitting there as an idle piece of property for the, for the district. So we don't see where the growth is there, where we need that piece of property. It's a property that you could get rid of. So that at a high level is it. There's a high level timeline, which it takes you out roughly through 2018. Um, and we tried to look at it in terms of where we had students impacted moving, tried to do that at the beginning of the school year. So that's a high level overview of what we're talking about. 
In terms of the rest of the slides, it talks about some of the pros and cons. There's much more detail in the report in terms of removing uh, the trailers being the first one. Some of the pros you're talking about improved security. It doesn't require a lot of capital cost. You've got some future cost savings in terms of there's a lot of maintenance associated with the trailers and they're not very energy efficient and then some potential health benefits given the fact you have animal issues, potential animal issues, as well as uh, potential mold and mildew issues. And honestly, when you drive by some of the schools, it looks like a good windstorm would knock some of those structures over. Uh, in terms of cons, you're talking about increased student density within the schools. Uh, you've got some immediate expenses when you talk about demolition and removal uh, of those trailers, as well as some potential uh, work inside the school with respect to room dividers. You may lose some flexibility that you're afforded by having those extra rooms with the uh, trailers online and then what we'll call more cart usage. So you may have more teachers who are not full-time classroom teachers at an elementary school but doing specials, not having a room to call home that they'd have to have themselves on a cart and move from room to room. Then when you look at Wrightstown, we would look at closing it and looking at uh, repurposing it as well. So it's a small school, it's one of our smallest schools, it's the second oldest elementary school. Uh, you're talking about some issues with your uh, sewage system there, so spray irrigation system, not a true septic system, uh, avoidance of cost. Repurposing that facility, which they take your facilities at the LSAC facility, repurpose rights down for the, what you have going on at the LSAC facility, as well as the potential. It looks like space-wise you could also get out of 20 for another piece of property you don't need that you could sell. And then it looks like, from what we've done, you might be able to take that entire rights down population do some domino effect and keep that student population together, put it in one elementary school, and then look at some domino effects across Newtown, Goodno, and maybe a little bit of impact within Southampton, or Northampton, sorry. And then cons, you don't have a school in Wrightstown Township any longer. Uh, some students are gonna have a longer ride to and from school. Now you're talking about taking the capacity of those receiving schools up to 90%, and then it does require redistricting so the impact there, obviously, it's an impact on people. And then when you close a school, you impact also the employees, not just the population. So you're talking about loss of jobs, so on and so forth. Thanks, Kevin. Um, reset, relocation, LSAC 20, Ford Road to the repurposed rights down facility. Get a long-term home. It gets us out of that LSAC lease, which gives us some cost savings. Our understanding is that the LSAC group would like us out of that building so we don't see a huge cost to get there. And then you're looking at, you'd have to do something with 20 Ford Road to get it there. So you're going to have to spend some money to get the facility up to snuff for that. Uh, you have less usage in the facility, so less stress on that existing septic system. And then it's still a council rock control facility, so the fields, playgrounds are still available to the community. Um, again, you've got some cons. You've got to renovate, renovate the facility because you're going to have full-grown people, adults there, not elementary school kids. And for those of us who have been in an elementary school lately, those desks and, and bathrooms are awfully small for those who are full-grown adults. Um, you may not be able to move in for a while, so until after you get everybody out, it's going to take some time. There's a cost associated with getting the Achieve and Sloan School out of the LSAC facility, so if we get out of it, no matter where you go, you've got a cost. The estimate we received was roughly five and a half million dollars. And again, it, depending on where you live, it's going to change your commute because you're talking about going from one place to another. So some people are going to have a longer ride, some are going to have a shorter ride. <coughs> Holland Middle School, so we feel after you renovate it, you've got the potential to house both the Holland Middle School population and the Richboro Middle School population in that facility. Uh, it would cost less to remodel it than as opposed to building a new school, so you're talking about 36 million versus a roughly $55 million cost. Uh, we think it's a relatively short timeline of 24 to 36 months. You'd have to complete the renovation before you could close the Richboro Middle School, so facilitate some quicker renovation because you're not doing it in a fully populated school, so you can do the construction work as you move some students and teachers from room to room to get it done. Uh, it's an impact, obviously, on the Richboro Middle School students because now they're going to have a, a different commute uh, because they're going to a different facility. Uh, there's some serious renovation in some of the classrooms that are required because we have some odd shapes and open spaces. And then when it's done, you're talking about a school that's going to operate at full capacity. The, the next one, and I'm going to skip this slide because we've got it on both. You're talking about at the end of the day when you're done this, redistricting the entire district. And then if you look at the demographics there, you may have the potential to pull a second school offline depending on where your students are. One of the things when we looked at the map, if you redistrict, it gives you a chance to get more what we'll call contiguous catchment areas for the elementary schools. So you don't have 
the, the patchwork quilt you have right now within your elementary schools, you have the same area all going to one school. Um, again, depending on your demographics and enrollment, you may be able to take a second school offline. One of the things you want to be able to do is minimize the disturbance to the students and families when you redraw the boundaries. Um, and then when you get there, you want to make sure that all your trailers are off. So you got to make sure your numbers are there so you don't have trailers in place. And it helps you plan for the closure of that Richboro Middle School in future year and hopefully get it so you can balance your enrollment so you have enrollment roughly even in your two middle schools and then roughly even in your two high schools. So phase one we would say would be done once you part as you close and repurpose Wrightstown Elementary School and then part two of the southern end would be done as you get ready to close Richboro Middle School. And that's, sorry, on the right side there is a, a rough map. When you look through the detailed uh, document you have, you have details of the demographics of what we think the numbers are within each one of those areas as well as uh, a blow up shot of that map of what it is in terms of what it would look like and what the impact is on each area. So close the mill, should sell Richboro Middle School once you're done, so sale of the property so you contribute funds for future either capital projects or you can offset some of the money you have to borrow. We don't have an appraisal of time what that property's worth. Uh, one of the things about the demolition we don't know whether it makes sense to demolish it or keep it there, so you'd have to look at that and make the right decision because it costs $400,000 to demolish and clean up the site. That may not need to want to do it. And then when you take a school offline, you do get some savings of roughly, I don't know if it's a, we got a number between 1.2 and 1.5 million, but you get some administrative savings because you take that cost out of the system. Um, one of the cons of selling it, you take a facility uh, offline in case student enrollment increases. Uh, both your remaining middle schools will be at closer to full capacity. You have, again, a loss of jobs and impact to the community if you close the school. Redistricting is inevitable, and then if you have to demolish it, you have a $400,000 cost. That's one of the things, if you decide to close, you've got to make the right decision with respect to financials. Uh, the, the probably the most controversial, challenging recommendation for our group was whether or not we build a new Newtown Middle School or renovate it. Uh, so it's... The pros to building a new one are it replaces an asset that needs significant renovations. We see it as less risky than renovating the existing structure given when that structure was built. Who knows what unknowns you're going to have as you start to take walls down, when you start to replace some of the infrastructure. We know there's asbestos in the facility. Who knows what other challenges we'll find in there. Uh, when you talk about going from three schools to two, by rebuilding it allows you to appropriately and readily size this for the right population. Positions us for two middle schools feeding two high schools. And then by building new, it creates less disruption than renovating the existing structure on the schools. Cons, the biggest con is it costs more money. You're talking about $55 million for a new school versus $47 million to renovate. Uh, one of the challenges with large capital projects historically is uh, they tend to go longer than you plan and they tend to cost more than you plan unless you really, really manage them quite well. Um, you have things called unforeseen site conditions and scope creep, which inevitably happens, so you've got to make sure you control that or quickly your $55 million can be $75 million. Uh, and then by doing this new one, you're going to create significant disruption on that site with respect to parking and athletic fields during the construction phase. And then the, the last one is that the house tract. Basically, you're sitting on a piece of property that doesn't have any, it has value, but it's an asset. It's not a cash value. You convert that. You don't see a long-term need for that to convert that to cash. So there you are in terms of from a financial side. So the Pell report we were given says there's no real expectation for growth. Uh, the cons, you have a relatively modest income stream from superior turf that you would lose, and then you lose the flexibility of having that, uh, that idle land in case there's a growth, and then that land is opened up to potential real estate development in the future. And then we had a few other items uh, for consideration as you do this. We've got to keep the students, teachers, faculty safe and secure while we're using student facilities. Transportation and dust bus depot facilities. You know, what are the transportation costs? We're going to stay with gas. We're going to go with propane in the future. Obviously, we have safety and environmental concerns of fuel storage for buses on district property. Then there's some sustainable energy, energy and green construction stuff we need to consider as you go forward with respect to solar arrays, wind generation, green rooftops, geothermal systems. And then when you talk about going to a potential BYO policy, BYOD policy, do we have the internet capacity, the Wi Fi? connectivity as well as charging stations. And that is it.
Um, before you, General, I just want to make sure nobody has any clarifying questions at this point. Something that you saw you just want to be clear on? Just real quickly. Um, the savings that you have for closing schools, <coughs> that was exclusive of transportation savings? That was exclusive of transportation savings, yes. And the only mention I heard, it was, it was focused on elementary schools, it was focused on middle schools. There was a, a reference, maybe a passing reference that, is my mic not on? Okay, cool. Um, there was maybe a passing reference to the impact this would have on the high schools. Was there a comment that this would more evenly balance the two high schools? One of the things we would like to see if we were able to get through the redistrict of the middle schools is to balance the high schools so you have a more even load between the two high schools. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I want to note that these uh, presentations will be posted uh, for the public. So I apologize, but people are working up till last minute. So we didn't have them posted ahead of time, but they will be out there after the meeting. Group two, or uh, option two. Will the PowerPoints also be online? Yeah, I think that's what will be online. Oh, so not, not this. Uh, the full, I, I until we read them. To, fairness, I didn't talk to Tim and Chris about their PowerPoints being online. I did talk to them about the proposals being online, which synthesizes. Which would you have any that. objection to the PowerPoints being online? We would not. Okay. okay. So then we'll post both. That's good. We just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Hello. Hello. Um, first off, I want to echo Chris and Kevin's comments of thanking the planning committee. Uh, while we are the ones who get up here and talk, uh, it's really the work of many, many behind the scenes and tireless hours that have produced these, these uh, presentations uh, so we get the credit I guess for, for being up here if they go badly then I will point people out <laughs> but, um, for now we'll, we'll go with it going positively uh, so um, I also want to say uh, thank you to the board because this has been a very um, insightful process for me I've not been involved a lot with the district uh, so I got to learn and this really was a collaborative effort um, and I feel it really came out with a balanced approach. This is not the extreme of one person, but it's a moderation of many. So this proposal really does balance itself out, and, and the process was extremely, um, I thought, uh, productive. So with that. Um, just a reminder as to why we're here and why was, uh, did the board ask us to come and uh, pull the community members together and start to look into changes that had to uh, be made within the Council Rock School District. So we have an aging infrastructure, a declining enrollment, changing government re requirements, and rising costs per student. And when we look at the rising costs per student, um, the enrollment per the Pell report is expected to drop from about 11,438 students by about 20% down to about 9,224. We realize the further out you get, it gets a little fuzzier there, but going off the data in the Pell report, that's about a 20% drop. If we don't do anything with our expenses, our, our cost per student will go from about $18,700 per student up to about 23,200. Well, maybe that's not too bad. It all depends. But when you look at our peers or some of our surrounding districts, that's central bucks on how they rate cost per student. And then when you look at the rest, this is where they would fall out. So right now, where we are probably middle of the pack, certainly if we do nothing, we would be well above all the surrounding school districts. Another portion, another uh, consideration is, if we do nothing, this is the capital plan that uh, Doug Taylor has put together. We are gonna have to spend $130 million just to maintain the facilities we have today over the next 10 years. That's to do nothing more than to make sure the roofs don't leak, to make sure the systems don't fail, and to make sure that our facilities are safe. So this $130 million is coming, whether we like it or not. So, it's time to do something. We have a dropping student population that's projected, and we already have a deferred maintenance uh, profile that we have to deal with.
part of the thing we wanted to consider was the, um, all the strategic planning that Mark and his team have already done. We want to make sure our proposal aligned very well with the vision that was already out there. People come to Council Rock because of the schools. People come to this area because of the schools. I myself personally, when we moved, I asked my wife, you can pick where we want to move because I'm working in Philadelphia. She picked this area because of the schools. That's very important and we wanted to make sure we kept that with any of the changes that we recommended. Now, with our recommendation, I know we love acronyms around here, so part of our group was thinking about how do we package this? How do we put all of our facets together? So we were thinking of the Council Rock Action Plan. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just fair warning, you're going to get to hear a lot of our crap, so just sit tight and you'll, you'll get to hear. So what are the facets of our recommendation? There are really five just parts. Just a I'm quick sorry. question, should we change it to crap at crsd.org if you want to email us? <laughs> this was before I knew the slides were going on out into the public. So. <laughs> You may want to censor them after, after this. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there are five facets to our proposal. Um, the first one, and one of the fundamental ones, is to achieve the 700 student facility. There's a lot of detail in the presentations that everyone has. We're not going to go through a lot of that detail. We'll go through some of it. But if you want to know why we are supporting that, there's pages of it in our proposal to, to get through. So under the 700 model, we would be able to phase out the trailers, we would close two elementary schools, uh, Rolling Hills and Wrightstown, uh, as part of this proposal. We would size the middle schools appropriately. And what that would allow us to do is uh, drop down to two middle schools. So we are supporting, our proposal recommends moving forward with the Newtown Middle School, re building a new building, and then um, keeping Holland Middle School and then having the elementary schools feed into those two. So dropping down from three down to two. Uh, invest in future technology. We want to take the opportunity. Technology is the way of the future. I think if we are short-sighted, we are going to miss an opportunity to make sure we have the right infrastructure in our schools. Uh, we are recommending the relocation of the LSAC so we would be able to get out of that lease and the 24 facilities so we would have the option to either sell or repurpose that facility as well. And then once all that's done, the redistricting. Uh, much like the first proposal, we would recommend a, a uh, overall total district redistricting. We had it phased in three pieces uh, with no student moving more than once, but we were, this would be the end goal once everything is done, is to redistrict to get up to the 90% capacity in the schools. So part of why the 700, the blue line on this graph is the student population that's expected to dip down. The red is what is our capacity at our schools. So the good news is we're always above, we have more capacity than students, which is always good. But as you can see, if we don't do anything, that capacity is going to get very large. So in the 2012-13, that's about a 12% capacity we have built in. As you go out, that would grow to over 20% unless we do something to reduce the capacity at our schools. And having 10 partially filled schools is not the most efficient. The other thing I will stress about our proposal is flexibility. We are looking to build something that can be built upon in eight to 10 years. To try and come something that's so locked in, then you're really gonna struggle. So while we are not endorsing a full-time kindergarten program, because we think there are higher and better needs at this point, by the year 2020 or, and 21, we would have enough capacity in the schools that we could offer full day kindergarten without having to build out any additional facilities. We may need some renovation money to change the classroom sizes within a school, but we would not have to grow at that point. So we fix a number of issues up front and then we have capacity on the back end. If the district at that point still doesn't want it, we could always look to take a third school off at that point if so chosen. But we're not, that's not part of our recommendation, it's just leaving the flexibility into the proposal for when we get to that time. The other part of going to the 700 school, student school, is the efficiency. So we have found that when you have a 700 student school, you're able to 
get closer to your maximum class sizes. And we are not recommending sticking 28 or 30 students in a school, but as you can see here, on October 2013, our average class size was 23.4 in the elementary schools. By going to the 700 student school, you will go up to 24.4. That, coupled with the student drop, would be a reduction of 46 classes. And that's part of the reason we are looking to close the schools, but that's going to be part of where we're saving our money as well. One of our other facets was the middle schools. So we are recommending a, a feeder pattern, which would have these elementaries feed to this middle, feed to these high schools. And there's a couple benefits to this. One of the benefits is now students would no longer be um, uh, split or moved around. They would feed contiguously straight through. It also takes advantage of the appropriate sizing. So Council Rock South is 7 eighths the size of Council Rock North. But if you look at their populations, Council Rock South has more students than the North. By restructuring the feeder pattern, Newtown, which is bigger than Holland, and Council Rock North, which is bigger than South, would have the appropriate feeders to properly balance the student population to the school size. Our team painfully went through the insight tool to come up with the redistricting and to go from the 10 on the left, which is the current, with some gaps and pockets in there. Our recommendation is on the right, is the eight districts that we would have that make up the elementary schools. All of them are more contiguous and all of them uh, have better geographical boundaries as to what make up their areas. From a middle school standpoint, same thing, we would go from three to two, and this is also how the high schools would feed in. But one of the benefits of the redistricting, one of the biggest benefits is, here's what our proposed or expected enrollments will be at each of the schools. And as you can see down the far right-hand column, we are very close to that 90% target, which will allow us to realize the, the most cost-effective management of our schools. The one in question right now that would give a little cause for concern is Holland Middle School, where you're very close to 100%. But my understanding is there is room in that building if we had to, but also this is before the drop in the student population. So this is at its peak, and then it would start to go down from there if the Pell report is accurate. One pitch for technology. Um, also, the, we're in support of the bring your own device to school. We see that as coming. This is a great opportunity as we are ripping things up and we are rebuilding. This is a great opportunity to make sure our schools have the appropriate infrastructure so students have the appropriate tools they need in the school. And this is really about future-proofing our schools uh, so we don't make very short-sighted decisions now and then have to invest more money later when we have to go back through and, and fit out these schools. We have come up, I don't expect everyone to be able to see this, but we have come up with a timeline as to when each of the facets would go. Newtown Middle would be the first. Uh, then we'd be able to close Richboro Middle upon its completion. <coughs> then we'd renovate Hillcrest and Richboro simultaneously to take advantage of some um, similarities in their build out. Then we'd be able to close Wrightstown and we'd be able to close Rolling Hills. Then we'd re we are recommending repurposing Rolling Hills for the LSAC and the Twining Ford uh, business that goes on into those sites, um, into those areas. So there's roughly the, act, the years it would occur and our expected um, cost or borrowings that we would need for each of those years. So ultimately, the board's going to have to answer for what's the financial impact. Because as much as we want to make sure we are following the excellence that Council Rock has brought us, we also want to make sure that we are stewarding the taxpayers' dollars as efficiently as we can. So, our recommendation of cost, separate from the $130 million, is about $110 million. And that's what we are estimating each of those uh, fit-outs and repurposings and demolitions are going to cost, about $110. For the schools that we are not touching in part of our proposal, um, we realize that Council Rock, Mark and his team are still going to have to go through and 
make some capital investment into those buildings. So the top line is $110 million that our recommendation is putting forth. The other capital needs for buildings that aren't on there, like Sol Feinstein, Feinstone, is another $64 million. Our technology infrastructure investment is about $2.2 million. So our recommendation is we would be borrowing and spending $176 million. So that is the, um, that are the, those are the pieces over and above, or, or should be compared to the 129 million or the 130 million if we do nothing. So the $130 million train is coming. We are recommending spending more, 176 million, to be able to make up the difference, to, to enact the plan and the proposal that we see, that we've laid out for you. Now what's the cost of that? So that 176 million is gonna cost about 267 million over the debt, over the life of its debt. So the debt service cost through 2035 is going to be about 267 million as compared to 204 million for the do nothing option. So our recommendation is $63 million more over that life cycle of that debt. And this is what it would look like on the graph. The red line is uh, our recommendation. The blue line is the do nothing. So that area in between them is um, that 63, 64 million dollars is what makes up that difference. That dotted line, for your reference, is that 17 uh, million 50 thousand uh, that Mr. Reinhardt likes to hold to, so we don't have to have any tax increases. If we can keep our debt service at that line, we don't have to have tax increases. Well, clearly here, we are going above that. But what we're not reflecting are the savings from our program. So our elementary school efficiencies from, from shrinking those 46 classes, we would be able to recommend in 2014 dollars to save $3.6 million. Um, for the facilities closures, another $3.6 million. The middle school restructuring of being able to go down um, uh, one school, but also we believe that we will be able to go down about three teams upon the consolidation and the drop in the student enrollment will save about 1.8 million, and then the uh, LSAC lease of 660,000. So we will save 9.7 million conservatively. This does not take into account the uh, avoidance of debt because we don't have to maintain as many buildings, and it doesn't take into account um, uh, any of the um, any of the sales of the real estate that would come in as a one-time savings. Once again, comparing that 9.7 to the do nothing proposal, our student population is expected to decline. We would save 2.2 million just from that decline of those schools if we did nothing else. So now your good number is that an annualized number? That's an annualized number. Perfect. Thank Thanks. you. So when we now look at what that means, our debt service would go up, so we would expend some amount of money in annual debt service cost, but when you net out the annual operating savings, you now see the red line, our proposal, drops below the blue line, and it drops below the dotted line. Now, yes, this is oversimplified because the savings would come over time. This is just to show if at all by 2025, when we recognize or we expect everything to be in place, that's when it would drop off you can see not only does the red drop below, but it drops below if we do nothing. And once again, through 2035, we'd expect the cumulative savings for that would be 18.8 .8 million, but we've taken out 9.7 million from our expense base through this process. So the only, the last thing I'd like to close on is when you hear the proposals from each of the, the recommendations, uh, you'll see a lot of similarities, you'll see some differences, but the one thing I'd love to compel the board to do is not sit, sit still. Sitting still is just going to cost us more money and it's going to delay the inevitable of what's coming. If we miss a summer, we miss a year, we get 4% increases on all those numbers. All those costs are going to come up. So to me, if there's anything we can compel you, the, the committee can compel on, it's a call to action to hopefully do something. So with that, I thank you. Thank you.
Any clarifying questions from the board? I have a question. Yes, Mr. Bailey. Yes, so on slide eight where you had the capacity, uh, sorry, you can't bring it back up. Is there, thank you. Uh, slide eight where you had the line showing the capacity. Sorry, give me one more second. This one? Yeah, the initial drop in 2012-13, is that the trailers that you're showing? That's some of, yeah, those are just the uh, modulars that have come off to this point, correct? So those are actual drops. Okay, very good. Correct. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And when you show the 90% um, capacity, the, the, the enrollment numbers you're using are this year's numbers? Correct, I believe so. For those, yes, so those are this year's. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thanks for clarifying. And option number three. So I do not have fancy PowerPoint, <laughs> and following the boys is never easy. So I am Heather Brossman. I was heading up the community team, which is very much where I have my heart and soul lying. So. Our presentation is written out in a pros and cons format. Um, I really appreciate um, the group. We had some fantastic people who really sat in debate. And instead of it being a heated argumentative thing, it became very enlightening. I feel very educated about our school district. We have great people running things. And we have really great people in our community that were willing to have a dialogue. So the plan that you see is more a dialogue of what we've had. So I'm going to try to summarize um, for you. Instead of reading it through, it's in an outline format of pros and cons of things that we were asked to look at. Um, I'm just going to kind of tell you in dialogue about the plan that you can look at in um, format. So I represented the community team and then the combination of team three. And I believe that we proudly offer our insights in this document um, through these six months of learning about our school district. We learned about busing. Um, and that is not a simple task and how legislation mandates a lot of the things that as parents you take simply as putting your child on a bus. Um, we looked at school culture, facilities, and the aging infrastructure that we have clearly and how um, we have some challenges in our district that you all are facing. We really appreciate the school board letting us have a part in this. I don't feel like any of these decisions are simple. I really came in just thinking the modular some come offline easy peasy and that is not the case. Um, I feel like you have a big puzzle in front of you, and we have a lot of if this, then this scenarios. In our group, we um, really tried to look at what makes Council Rock great. We talked a lot about that, what makes our school district unique. People wanted to bring up different districts and what they did. Um, other school districts redistrict every year. Their children don't stay on the same path from elementary school through high school. And we really tried to look to see if there was anything about what makes Council Rock great or what configurations are best for kids. And there really is no research out there. As a researcher, I really was trying to seek um, information to look at and have clear answers. And there really aren't any. So I want the community to know that. Um, but Council Rock really is a great school. And we really are trying to be brave and look to the future. So as a group, we did agree on a few things. Um, we agreed that our schools are aging. Our homes are also aging. And as Tim alluded to, what brings people to our community and will have them purchase the homes that are aging in our community is the real, um, somebody called it the marketing of Council Rock, or the great name that Council Rock has. It's a very recognizable rate, uh, name in school districts. People want to come to Council Rock when you say, that you go to Council Rock, people recognize that as a strong school district, and that helps us sell our homes. So I really want people who um, are nervous about this process to know that our schools are really keeping our home and our property values very high and marketable. Um, we really felt like the modulars did not and do not represent the best of what Council Rock has to offer. They were a five-year plan 15 years ago and we really would like to see them go. With that, we understand that the modulars can't easily come offline and just be placed into our school. And in fact, a lot of discussion revolved around how our children right now are put in retrofitted spaces. Um, they're called atypical spaces. I think they're closets and need to go back to being closets and our schools being renovated and remodeled with this idea that we need to educate our kids in the best practice with natural sunlight and um, air conditioning and climate control. 
even with the declining enrollment, again, these we can't just bring the kids out of modulars back into the school, so redistricting, it seems as though most people in the community recognize this as being inevitable in order to fix the declining enrollment and the aging infrastructure of the schools. During this time, we love um, the rebuilding of our schools to reflect our community and how they utilize our schools. Our schools have become hubs for communities, for basketball games for families to watch, for the fields to be used as soccer fields and football fields and baseball fields. And our PTOs are large entities within our elementary schools and um, should be reflected within the spaces that we're building. So closing a school with dec declining enrollment has become apparent. We didn't want to look at Decision Insight and tell the board which school we thought should be closed, but the two schools that were the most standout for needs for renovation and funds having to be put into them were Wrightstown and Rolling Hills for some of the unique issues that um, the gentlemen have already presented to you. Wrightstown couldn't be expanded, has other issues that we've already talked about, and Rolling Hills has some issues as well. But um, Rolling Hills also has some elementary schools that sit very close to it. We thought that that would be good for redistricting. We also all agreed um, that the LSAT lease should be terminated and that those activities could be moved into the school-owned properties and be reconfigured for those purposes. One of the biggest dialogues that we discussed was um, the big truck deliveries that come out to um, that building and house storage. and. A lot of communities get up in arms when you see big trucks, but I think that um, that still is a small problem and could be overcome. We were asked to look at full day kindergarten, and we did discuss full day kindergarten quite a bit. You see some of the pros and cons in the paperwork that I gave you. Some of the pros were that it helps children get a leg up um, starting with full day. They can pack more information into a full day program. Some cons were that kindergarten isn't mandated by the government, it seems like that all the mandation and the legislation is what drives kind of our educational process and also requires a lot more space. So if full day kindergarten was something that the district really felt was a need, this is the time to look at it as we're looking at um, making spaces fit the uses of our school. Um, we also felt that bringing in full day kindergarten would have some unique impact on the community that many businesses are built around providing full day kindergarten programs and they are bringing tax revenue into the school and that's something really unique to look at. We also thought that bringing in full day kindergarten would require reconfiguration of elementary and middle schools where right now our middle schools are seventh and eighth grade and we even had um, Scott Petrie and um, Santa Sara come tell us that middle school should be as short and sweet as possible and maybe adding on to the middle school years wouldn't be a great idea. Again, I'm a pros and cons girl, so there they are. Um, helping reconfigure, however, would open up some of the classrooms in the elementary school level and then change the middle school. And right when we're in the time where we're going to be possibly rebuilding the middle schools, this would be the time to really implement that. There were a lot of ideas about how kindergarten could be implemented. I don't really know that that was our job, whether it would be one school as a trial or it would be slowly over the district. Tim had some great suggestions on how to make that happen. Um, then when we look at the middle school situation in Northampton, um, Richboro Middle and Holland Middle are both in need of renovation. And having tours of both of those buildings, it becomes obvious that they both have some serious needs. Um, one of the concerns for me about taking Richboro Middle and doing something with Rolling Hills is that you really do change quite a bit of the landscape in Northampton um, without there being too many changes to the rest of the district and that concerns me quite a bit and I think other members of the community as well. But I do think that many of those atypical classrooms need to be taken care of. Retrofitted closets and strange shaped rooms are going on with wild abandon over there and renovating them would be very nice. Um, the consolidation of those schools also allows the LSAT building to come into one of those buildings that have been taking offline, and then we look um, at the Twining Ford site, bringing those materials into a school that could um, be taken offline. We believe the house tract should be sold because at this point in time, if we weren't going to build a new middle school on the house tract, I'm not really sure when there would be a better time to do that. We'd also like to see a significant budget increase for technology, again, as we've mentioned, with forward thinking to the future. Keeping in mind legislation for keystone testing, remediation for children who don't do well with the testing, 
and other education, um, how education is moving much more towards um, the technologically advanced we'd like to see Council Rock keep up. And finally, um, with all these changes possibly coming to Northampton, we would like to see the pool at South and a stadium if we're really feeling it. <laughs> My team is laughing because they know I wanted to say that so bad. Um, so with that, that is basically our 18-page document in just normal people language. So thank you for letting me present it to you that way. Let me see if there are any clarifying questions. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, publicly make a few closing remarks um, at this time. Uh, be prior to this meeting, the board had a reception for all the members of the committee um, where they were invited and uh, we showed our appreciation. We gave them nice certificates. Um, but we really do, it's been very, very insightful. Every member of this board has said at one or multiple uh, public meetings the value add of having somebody who's not in this every day take their time and look at this and give us this information and we really really do appreciate that we um, plan to try to digest some of this information and the public can ask us questions and we'll ask questions so we may filter some of that information back through you um, and and correspond just if we don't have an understanding. Um, but it is this board's intent um, to review the information and make some decisions. So I think we spoke of taking action. Um, I, I've heard loud and clear from every member of this board that we maybe slowed things down by a year by having all of you do all this. But it was very, very valuable to have us have done that um, with all the other things we had going on. Would have we wouldn't have gotten as far, I don't believe. I don't know if anybody else feels differently, but I don't think we would have been able to do the job you did. It's very, very helpful. And I expect that as we look to make decisions on how we implement and what we implement, we may look for additional community input, and we certainly hope all of you would volunteer again to help us, as we do really appreciate the time you've invested. It's been very valuable. Thank you. For me, just one, one comment. I, I do appreciate the work of the groups, I, and I, it's very validating for me to have three different groups work going from three different perspectives, and, and many of the concepts that come forward are, are so closely related. I think that, that helps to validate it. You know, one of the things that we concern ourselves with on the board, or at least I concern, and I, I think others do as well, is sometimes because we're in the weeds, we come with one perspective, and people wonder, did we consider anything else? And I think this was very validating to to allow three groups to work autonomously um, and, and come to, to some consensus, um, maybe not on the exact details, but on, on the general concepts. And, and then it comes to us to help to try and harmonize among what we saw. So I, I appreciate that validation to, to bring a, uh, the whole concept of uh, crowd surf, not crowd surfing, crowd sourcing, getting many bright people to do things and coming together with a commonality, uh, I think that's, you've, you've proven that tonight and you've helped, helped this board tremendously. So for me, and I'm, I'm sure everyone agrees, that y your work is very valuable to us. Thank you. Mr. Everson? Um, what I would like to know is if any member of the team, if any team disagrees with the recommendation or any aspects of the recommendation, I think that person should have also an opportunity to uh, tell us why they're dissenting from the, uh, uh, the recommendation or any part of that recommendation. I'd like to hear that. Uh, not tonight, but they welcome to come forward at another time and let us know. The email is going to be open for any ideas. So if anybody wants to write to us about, any, or we're at boards at, <laughs> board, board, at members. C, board members at crsd.org. How I could forget that, I don't know. So we can get email from anybody anytime. But yes, yeah, certainly we are open if, if there was an idea that you had put forth that didn't make it through your group, but you would like this board to hear it, we're certainly open to that email. If I may, Mrs. Thomas, um, I echo the comments that you've made about the quality of the people. It was a pleasure to get to know some of you, to reacquaint myself with others. Um, but the cumulative work of the 42 people who joined us to begin with and the core, I think, of about 25 or 30 that stayed with us 
was amazing and it brought a lot of different perspectives from a lot of different places in the school district together. I particularly want to thank Heather, Kevin, Chris, and Tim who were the leaders of these groups over the course of that time. They spent a lot of extra hours with, the, with our teams to go over this work and to help coalesce the work that came out together tonight. I also want to thank our administrative team because they spent a lot of time both initially and then as they, we were accumulating this work to act as resources for the teams to answer questions. Most particularly Doug and Bob spent a lot of time with the groups as they finished doing the capacity work, the facility work, and the finance work. In the end, if you talk about synergy, it really was an amazing synergy between the information that the school district had and the thoughts and comments and ultimately recommendations that this committee had. So I really thank you for the work. It's been valuable for me not only to see the work that came forward, but also to get to meet such a great group of people. Thanks. One last, one last, which was, um, Doug's in the back, right? I, yeah. I was, I, Doug, I was amazed. I, I sat in on a meeting, they were discussing it, and every few seconds they would go, well, the number from Doug is. So Doug was responding to a lot of <laughs> questions about what would this cost, how much does this happen, uh, and, and I tend to believe as is Doug's way, which he, he presented an answer. The question was asked, he presented an answer to the question that was asked without bias and without, you know, gilding the lily. Um, obviously, a lot of work goes into that but from Doug. Obviously, as, as Bob's numbers were referenced in, in the presentations uh, in reference to a 17 you know, 50 number. Um, that that information, I, I think, was forthcoming to everybody, and I appreciate the work of the administration to support the, the data request from the people. Anyone else like to make a comment? Well, I, Mr. I, Sexton? Against probably what more people did than not, I visited every single group. I sat in with each of you. Uh, I spent, I don't know, Denise was with me for a whole lot of it, or we were in different places, but at the same time, it, it, it is fascinating to watch each group work, and uh, I know how hard you did, how hard you worked at it. We greatly appreciate. You know, I'm the one that's like, oh, we should have done it last year, but it, it has been very worthwhile. And you have looked at every issue that this community talks about. So you talked about, uh, you talked about the full day kindergarten. Some people talked about charter schools. You talked about every issue that people in the community talked about, and you did it in an open, let's look at this idea way. It, it was really, I learned a whole lot listening to you. And I so appreciate the financial work that you did and, and, and the timing of it for us. So wonderful work. We're very fortunate to have you. And I really hope when you look around this room and see how crowded it is right now, many nights we look out there and we see two people. Often they're grumpy. <laughs> it would be really nice if all of you would come regularly because we need your we need and your not support. be grumpy <laughs> we need your intelligence you can be grumpy i am always you know we need you so please come and be with council rock you're you're, you're um, a very big part of our future not from the back <laughs> To the mic, and if you could just give us your name. Um, I know it, but my name is Brooke Holdsman. Um, I was on Team One. My, I just wanted to ask the board to very uh, carefully consider when redistricting uh, the kids who are able to walk to the schools um, from where they live, because there's been there was a lot of discussion and, and no no rec no um, decisions have been made. But when I look at um, a school like Rolling Hills that has so many walkers, and I understand that the school might need to be closed because there's uh, so much work in that school that needs to be done. But if you consider, I think it actually more strongly impacts middle schools and high schools where kids are more independent. And uh, with the uh, reduction of late bus uh, availability and a lot of parents working, I think it's important that as many kids um, as possible are able to have that option to either walk to school or walk home after school. And um, when you consider your redistricting boundaries, um, I ask you to please seriously take that into consideration uh, to not affect those kids who are within walking distance. Thanks. Thank you.
Anyone else? Mr. Dr. Foster, I, would you I, like to make a Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks again. It's, it's not possible to thank you enough. The, uh, the work, this work for the community is incredibly important and, and impactful and obviously detailed from your presentations. Um, I want to echo Mrs. Sexton's uh, comments and say you, you're certainly welcome. But in addition to coming here and serving in, in, in any other capacity, you're going to be asked questions from community members about these plans, and so I hope you'll you'll have the energy and joy of sharing your deeper perspective with them as they question, well, do you really need to close a school? Uh, does it really make sense to sell that property? Whatever the questions are, um, please be ambassadors for your own good work, and thanks again. Ms. Brooks? I, I want to just echo you know, a lot of the similar sentiments that um, Patty and Bill have just said. First of all, thank you so much um, for all your hard work. Um, but as, as we begin to discuss this, um, undoubtedly rumors are going to spin in, in the community and a lot of misinformation unlike, will likely come out. And so um, I realize for some of you, your work is done and, and now you really don't want any visibility in the public. But for some of you, maybe um, you will be less intimidated to do that. And you know, we really need good information um, circulating in the community so that misinformation doesn't spiral out of control because that happens a lot. But anyway, um, I, I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to sit with all the groups and um, there were familiar faces in every group, but there were lots of new faces in, in the group. So it was a privilege uh, to meet all of you and see your good work, and I just thank you so much for all your effort. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. We will, at our July meeting, be deliberating about what our next steps will be, um, just to set per uh, appropriate expectations. I don't expect that we will, uh, at that point, lengthy debate. I like this piece and that piece, and what about walkers and some of the details. We simply need to now decide on a plan for ourselves. What do we do with this information? I believe that we've talked about, as a group, having some more public meetings. We've got to start to whittle down what we think, and so this board has a great deal of work to do. So please come in July, if you like, or watch us from home at your pool. But uh, please feel free to, to let us know, and if there's things that you think or you have insight on next steps you'd like to see, please feel free to share them with us as well. Thank you very much, and please feel free to stay for the rest of the meeting, if you'd like. Now they feel bad about going home. No, well, you know. Don't feel that bad. <laughs> okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we are going to move on at this point to our consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Grupp, can you make the motion, please? I'm going to ask that item K be removed, or I can disregard it. You're good, right? Okay, no problem. Go ahead, Mr. Grapp. That's fine. I move. Oh, I have a question before I do that. The, I note that the graduates are listed here. Are we being asked to approve the graduates? It's just listed, so there's nothing, there's no call to action on that. When what? you approve the consent agenda, you approve those attachments that are therein. <coughs> and that's what we talked about earlier this year. We've not done that before, but the board asked that we approve the graduates based on what we were doing with the, um, with the early graduates. I, I understand so. that. It's just, it's just a list. There's no call to action that says... We're approving that they can graduate. Yes, I understand. You Everything approve else. the list of graduates as part of it. Fine. I move to approve the consent agenda items A through M as contained in the attachment to the agenda subject to audit. Second. If there's another way to present them, I'm happy to do it. It's the I first just, time we've done All it. I was asking was that there would be a representation in the same way that you do it orally, that you represent to the board that they've met their criteria, and you're asking for the board to approve the graduation. That's all. I so, so. Amend it. What thing. Jerry said, for the record. Yes. <laughs> but if you want to turn them down, I've got about 503 people. That Please don't go in over. and pick out Probably a child about or two. About 1,048 people who are yeah. going to, or 38, depending on how we do it. In I, looking I at this. I just have a quick question yep. Mr. Reinhardt. Um, uh, why is it that the cost and 
scope of the senior trips for the two high schools don't match? You know what, I would have to go back to the principals and find out. I do know that they do things differently, but I have to get an itemized list of that. I mean, they're on the same time, right? Yes, but I believe there's different items that they select. Barry, do you know more about that? I mean, I can give you a simple example that I know that um, one of them includes an additional meal. Yeah, no, I looked at it. I mean, some yeah. do the meal plans this way, some do the meal right. plans. I'm just curious, there's a cost differential, you know, they're all going at the same time. Like, I just, yeah, it's just a curiosity. The, yeah, I think the cost differential is made up where some of the students have to pay for a meal when they get down there out of pocket that makes up for what's paid as part of the cost of the trip initially. I think they, they end up being relatively equal. I can't answer the question why they choose to do it differently, though. While we're on that topic, I, I'm, I uh, am not going to, my, my uh, approval tonight will exclude the items regarding the uh, travel and the approval for the uh, senior class trip. So when it comes to me, I'll be approving with the exception of G. My, my issue with this continues to be that I don't think the school district should be in the, in the travel business. I, uh, I still look at uh, senior years for students uh, between this and the travel some students do for orchestra, band, and then we do this. As an, as an expensive proposition, I, I don't know that I want the school district to continue to be in the travel business. So I will withhold my approval for G. It does prompt the question, Mr. Reinhardt, which is for the senior proms. Apparently only South is planning senior proms. This was brought to us because they were able to get a three-year deal and they were asked to put it on as soon as we could get it. And we they do it at different locations. North, uh, and North, South North different doesn't venues. do theirs in the same location. No, my kids and, and went to you, sell. you know, just for the public's sake, we don't pay to send anybody on it. No taxpayer money is used to send them on a senior trip, with the exception of chaperones who go. And we don't, we don't pay to send them on um, to go with the choir, except for the band directors or choir directors that travel with them as, as is normal in, in those kinds of things. These are... Ex I, for my own child, I said no to the trip to San Francisco. But for my son who went on the, eighth, uh, the high school trip to Disney, uh, I'll out the poor person right now, he, it was the first time he said he felt a part of Council Rock. He had a wonderful, wonderful time and a memory that he, he would not have, have risked having. I, I don't like the idea of putting our kids on airplanes. There's danger in that as a mom. It always makes me nervous. But life is full of risk, I guess. Um, the kids want this. Their, their families expect it. I, I have, I, I, we don't pay the cost for this by and large. Okay, and you moderated your comment at the end and, and that was an important moderation by and large. Uh, we do have staff that travel for this. Some of that staff, I believe, we wind up backfilling for, uh, we, hire, we hire people to come in and fill. We also do have certain obligations under the IDEA and, FAIR and FAPE um, and, and uh, ADA that we do incur expense. Additionally, I will readily admit, and I didn't mean to mislead anybody, my comment was I didn't think we should be travel agents. And by saying that, I'm, I was not meaning to imply. We're not travel agents. Well, schools providing experiences. Excuse outside me, I, of the I was curriculum. not done yet, but I, I had said that we were not travel agents, meaning that we're arranging for the travel, and we're there is a travel agent involved, but we're fronting it. I still have not, to my satisfaction, received an idea of how this impacts now that we've changed to the Keystone tests versus the previous tests which had a different criteria because we used to have the PSSA or P, what are PSSAs, which was an 11th grade only test, and the children for the seniors traveled. Maybe it was a different time. Now, the Keystone tests aren't an 11th grade only test. So for me, and I'm sure that the majority of the board will approve it, and, and this is a right and historically custom, but for me, I don't like to be in the business of sponsoring as, a, as an organization, although we don't do it financially, by large measure, the, the traveling of students in this manner. So that's, that's my aspect. 
I think that our high schools have, uh, our 11th grade, or some of our, our classes are not only 12th grade kids are in this course, only 11th grade kids are in this course, only 9th grade, 10th grade. And so what happens is when you take kids out of classes, when there is a class in session, it adversely affects and impacts the other children. And that's my pers perspective. We, many people disagree, but that's my perspective, which is why I vote no for item G within this roster tonight. Any other comments? I have a question. I had a yes. question marked about costs also. Bob, do we know what the costs are to the district for these trips? I would have to accumulate the costs. I don't have that in my hand right now. Can you do that? And can you also just let me know, um, in, included in those costs, what the costs are to fill the uh, positions of the chaperones that travel also, please? Thank you. To be fair, I'm, I'm on cover both sizes. The out-of-pocket expenses for the chaperones, I, I, I want to be fair, I, it's, as I'll give you both sides if I know it. The out-of-pocket expenses for the airfare, for the chaperones, and for the people is covered within the price of the gathered from all the students. So it's not the district paying the airfare. Uh, if, if 700 kids between the two schools go, that money of what they're billed includes enough buffer to pay for the, the chaperones' travel expenses. I would argue the only expense we really have are the substitute teachers. We're going to pay those salaries anyway, and if we're not putting the subs in, there's no difference. But we so, are right. and, and the no, I said the substitutes. I and, would and argue. But the contract helpful. shows that for, off the top of my head, I think for every 20 paid trips, there's one that's free, and that that is. That's the budgeting I was that's speaking right. of. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's why it doesn't cost to send the teachers. It is. It is. Uh, my my advocacy against it is just the notion of travel. Having said that, it is a well-run program. The children are safe. The adults are responsible. It is a, um, a maturity aspect that I am proud of the kids for. I just don't want to be part of doing it. If you didn't say this every year, Mr. Rep, I wouldn't get a phone call from a couple kids saying, we heard the trip is canceled for next year and we can't go. I just want to make sure, <laughs> so I want to make sure your phone is working. Those, those kids calling me. <laughs> I've, I've already been assured that the trip for next year is canceled by the kids. So, so I want to I'm say, a big fan of yeah, it. Yeah, I want, I'll support item G. I just wanted to, as, an, yeah, uh, as a follow-up, to know the yeah. cost. Uh, I, I'm going to exclude uh, from my affirmative vote uh, item K, as I've done in the past, the treasurer's report over the concerns I have over the insurance coverage of, uh, and fees of where some of the funds are held. Are you voting no or just abstain? No. So when we come to vote, you'll repeat that, correct? If you'd like me to, I will. Yeah, when we actually call the vote, okay. you don't mind. You want me to repeat the entire No, no, no. Well, no. no one Unless, it's up to Kapoor. Okay. So we'll Just the, please don't go further. Okay, can we have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Foster? Yes. Mr. Grupp? With the exception of G, uh, I will vote yes. G will be no for me. Mrs. McKessie? Yes. Mrs. Sexton? Yes. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Block? Yes. Mr. Abramson? Yes. Mrs. Brooks? Yes. Mr. Bilek? With the exception of K, the Treasurer's Report, yes, K is a no for me. Okay, okay moving along. Mrs. Sexton, can you take item number one for me, please? I move to approve the personnel actions as contained in the attachment to this agenda. Second. Second. Questions for Ms. Turley? Can you just talk a little bit about the counselors and the continuity that you're talking about maintaining? Yes. Microphone. So if you take a look at the, the memo that outlines the request for the additional counselor, there is a revision since the memo went up that I wanted to point out. I have learned that the mid-November date that the Can memo you speak up a little bit. Mm -hmm. The mid-November date that the memo is based upon is actually November the second. So it reduces the cost that I have put by six thousand two hundred and fifty-five. And I'm glad that you brought it up because it gives me an opportunity to point out that the cost is less than I had originally put forth in that memo. So as you can see, at Council Rock High School South, we've had a number of leaves for 
both maternity and illness over the span of the last two to three school years. So what we're asking is to keep the one counselor in place for three months um, supplemental time for continuity. One of the returning teachers is due to go out on November 2nd, only going to be in the building for a short period of time. So retaining the person that we're asking for in the memo will allow continuity for the students. What would you do if you didn't have that counselor for those three months? How would you handle it? We I would in know. fact have um, a counselor for the first two months she would go on maternity leave and we would replace her. And this, I want to be sure that you understand that that would mean for the seniors on that caseload, they would have had four counselors in four years. And that's, that's important in the recommendation. Typically, we would just fill the maternity leave as we typically do or the leave of absence. But in this situation, particularly with kids moving on to, to college, it allows for the continuity of that counselor to stay in place for those first two months at a critical time for many of our seniors who are applying to college at that time. Sorry, Christine. Having had a daughter yep. whose counselor changed because of leave a couple times, in essence, the counselor that wrote her recommendation, we had to spoon feed her the information because she wasn't the counselor who had gone through the first things with her um, for a couple months worth of pay. And I never want to spend, Willie and Eddie, there's plenty of work to be done in the counseling office, number one. Um, and, and number two, at the first quarter senior year, is it? horrendous time for college applications and trying to get those letters and then for a counselor who doesn't know anything it, for a parent that's involved you're trying to help but those kids who don't have their parents involved it's a bit of a struggle so it's a little bit of an exception for me because I think it's from a strictly financial point I don't know if you could just look at the finances really say it's absolutely necessary but from if it was at a different time of year I may even feel differently but just, I'm just saying for me, for that time of year and for that specific reason with those kids applying, I, I'm, I tend to lean a little bit to we should go ahead and do it. But that's just my thinking. I mean, I've heard feedback from some, of, uh, some parents who uh, have children who have had that change of counselor every year. And uh, it's not good for the kids. And um, so I, I was actually really pleased to see that you had thought outside the box for a solution that ordinarily we probably wouldn't consider because it is an additional expenditure. But um, I know that when my son was a senior, his counselor was going out on leave in November. Um, and so, I mean, so she was there the first two months and it was a mad frenzy to get all of that done. That first marking period for seniors, that relationship with the client, uh, with the client, <laughs> with the counselor is so critical. And so, um, you know, it, it's always hard to, to approve these added things, but I actually am very grateful for this. I think it, the added value and the sense of security and the peace of mind that that will give um, a large number of students is, is a tremendous plus, so I, I appreciate that. And I, I think there's a, the important nuance of this is the person that we'd like to keep in this position is a counselor who has been in place all of this school year. And that's where the continuity comes in. So she's been working with the students. She would stay on for those three months where it would be a supplemental person and remain on for the leave of the counselor who is returning for that brief window and then going back out. So that's an important piece. We're not just asking for an extra person, but to keep a person who has served students well in place for those critical first three months. That counselor who is returning has been out for a while, yes. for more than a year. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I'll agree with the notion, but I'll leave it to the administrators, but I would, I would expect that while that person returns and is entitled to appropriate salary and benefits as, as is befitting their tenure and, and job assignment that for the continuity of the students that person's tasks for the period that they will be here will not be to step back in front of the students where we have this person who were leveraging their past year of experience and if anything to, to, to build upon uh, Mrs. Thomas's comments that that crush of documentation that's coming through will I would suggest it is the administration's ultimate decision but that person's main attention will be the documentation more so than the than the front to the students because I'm losing the continuity I'm paying for. If that's not the intention of the administration, then please let us know now because I will vote no because I'm, I'm buying the continuity. No, that's what you're getting. Okay. 
agree. <laughs> you almost leapt out of your seat. I know. <laughs> Chuck, would you like to say anything? We've already, we've already prepared a list of tasks that will be done by the person who is coming back from leave that does not involve working with the things that we've talked about. So I mean, they are qualified to work for students, right. and, and there's no, no there's nothing to demean them or, or cast doubt. But I just want to cut the comments. Mr. Bialik. No, I appreciate the comments. The, uh, and I'm fine with, with the council. I also have questions about the um, three added elementary. I'm sorry, let's go back to the council for one second. So the, now it's roughly $15,000, I guess, something like that, $16,000. Is that coming out of budgetary reserves? Or is I'm assuming? Yes, in, yeah. the, okay. in the beginning, that's where we come. <laughs> and then the three additional teachers, I think you, Two. elementary school teachers? Two. Two, okay, that's better. Um, <laughs> that's also coming out of budgetary reserves? Yes. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the need for those teachers for me? Mrs. Please. McClendon, would you do the honor? Generally, when we prepare the budget each year, we include uh, a couple teachers in reserve because we don't know when we, um, when we start to prepare the budget, we don't know what the registration will look like. Um, so when we get our registration initially in March or so with the kindergarten students, new first grade students, and other students who are moving into the district, it gives, it gives us a general sense of how many students or how many teachers we need for the sections. What happened this year is we did not include any teachers in reserve as we have in the past. And we have an influx of students in first grade at Hillcrest and registrations for students to enter first grade at Hillcrest and second grade at Self Alliance now. Um, and so generally we, we don't, we're not in June having to close sections, but uh, we are before the school year ends, as of the first of June, we have to close Hillcrest's first grade, which may, means that students who are registering for the first grade who've moved in recently can't go to their neighborhood school, have to go to a um, nearby school. And we provide the transportation. Same thing's happening at Self Alliance. What's When you say influx, how many are we talking how many additional kids? Well, we're five over at Five over? Yes. Both schools? No, five, five over at um, Hillcrest, four, three over at Self Alliance now. Okay. Well, just okay. so, so we understand what that would have meant had we gone over and continued those children in those schools, we would have created another section at those schools. Yes. Uh, and reduced the class size from how many sections? To, uh, increased it from? So we're at three sections at uh, Hillcrest with... So we would have gone to four. We would go to one to four. <coughs> which would have driven the, the size of those classes down from maybe 28 to maybe 22 or lower. And I should say that the trend is we do get students who register over the side. So, you know, and particularly primary students. It, it seems that families tend to move into the district when their students, when their children are young. So we typically get more primary students registering in July and August as families are making settlement. They like to close out the school year in their current district, you know, make settlement and move into our district uh, in July and August. So if, if next year we have declining enrollment, what happens to these positions that we've now created? They're uh, filled with FTSs, which are full-time subs, which means that they own, they're only hired for the year. Okay. And they know when they're hired that their <coughs> position ends in June. And just one other question. So if, if we have five additional at Hillcrest, what does that take the class size up to, if you know? Well, with three sections. Yeah. Um, so we have, we have 27, 27, and 26. Six. With the five? With the, the five new, 27, 27? Yes, seven. because the maximum is 25 okay. students. So if we have three classes, 25 students, that's 75 students. We add five and one. We add two and one, two and another, and one and another. Or you would split it and make a fourth section. You mean if we, no, no, we you don't add the, a section? No, 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 you absolutely we, answered the question. That's, okay. That's good. Thanks. If we add a section, it brings it down. If we don't add a section, then that's what the class size is. And like. the max is a policy or a guideline? Guideline. Okay. Point of clarification. Okay. Point of clarification in a comment that was made before. The question was asked by Mr. Uh, Bilek about would these positions be funded out of budgetary reserve? And the answer is not immediately. It's not that they would be funded out of budgetary reserve. They would be funded out of 
the budget for that line item because that line item would not be overspent until later in the year. We are restricted by law from making changes to our budget or spending that, moving that money from our budgetary reserve to a specific line item until after the October deadline. So initially, that would be paid for out of the line item, and it would only be paid out of budgetary reserve if at some point during the year that line item were overspent, and then we would purposefully reallocate budget, and that would be part of our report. So just to stay legal for less, as they say in the insurance, it's not being paid out of budgetary reserve until there's a reallocation and the line items are overspent. Mr. McLennan, can I ask a question? Sure. So uh, that puts us at 80 students right now for Hillcrest, just for argument state today. Uh, and I will not hold you to this, but just based on your knowledge, how many more would you expect to register over an average summer? Um, in first grade, probably two or three more students. Okay, so you might be up somewhere between 83 and 85 at, by the school year? Yes. Do they come in in September? Do we see first, or not often? Not generally, usually by August, end of August we kind of know. Okay. But then what? Okay, that's all I need, thank you. Okay. But what, is, what actually has happened at, at Hillcrest, I have a parent who spoke to me about it, is when they hit 25 and they go to 26, not even 27, the first grader who could go in as the 26th child in the class is rejected from the building That's and right. sent to another building. Right. Or no. it's 27? No, what we generally will take the one over. So we currently have 78 children registered. All right, so that you got to the 26. The, the one child that I ha spoke of is being sent to, Hill, uh, to Roll, was sent to uh, Rolling Hills. His older brother is kept at Hillcrest. They, they just moved in and they're just beside themselves because the two children who don't know any wells are separated. So it is a, it, for me, part of me says, put them in, just keep them. Just to clarify though, the parents are given the option for both kids to go to Rolling Hills. Yeah, I understand that, but it's a school where they don't belong. They belong in the other school. Yeah, but that's so the, the, the whole of it is, it's, up, it's, a, it's an issue. It's an issue. I, I don't know that it's necessary for a kid to be told or have to be told when it's 26 or 27. We, it doesn't mean that I, I preclude the idea that we hire a new teacher and, 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 and split those classes, but I don't go into putting the kid at 26 or 27, shifting them to another school right away. There is space in, in, in uh, Hillcrest to keep a child there. I, I can't, I, it's- But it, when do you draw the line? Well, I mean, I think there are, th that's a question. All right, but 25 is a, is a guideline, it is not, mm -hmm. it is I, I'm not, just asking. It's yeah. not a rule. Uh, every teacher has their own set point on what is best, you know, is it a rule, Mr. The, the, the school board back in 99 approved the class size committee report. So yeah, all right, it we'll approved a report. It was, it was, it was, what happened was, it was part of, it was during a contract negotiation, it was either in 2000 or 2002, okay. where the board, we were meeting at South, at, South on the stage, and we approved uh, the recommendations of the class size committee. But, but no, it was, well, oh, that was the second one. That was, that was yeah. four through six. One All right, three. so in any rate, I don't know that a whole lot of educational harm would have come to keep one or two over in a class. I, I, that's just from my own life experience. Uh, with the idea that you know that if you're going over, you're probably going to split anyhow. And if there were not going to be a split, it would not have turned into a, a major disaster. There are other ways to handle these situations as well. You know, it's quite possible that rather than splitting the class, you take 26, 27 kids into a class and hire in a classroom aide to support the three classes. It can be done that way as well. Uh, I, I've had mixed opinions on that myself and how I felt about that. Uh, but when you split down to sizes of uh, 20 kids in a class, and then some kids go out for special services, you're, you, you have a teacher working with a class of 17. This is wonderful, but not particularly affordable. So there has to be a balance. And, and as we go forward, we may have to look at that balance. I, I, don't, I, I don't see a permanent harm being done to anybody um, with the extra one or the extra two. I don't think, and, and, and every teacher has their own set point for what works for them. 
Uh, I, I liked the uh, variety of opinion that you got from a, a, a reasonably large class size. So 30 for me was fine. 33 pushed me over the edge a little bit. And when I had to have 35 or 36, which I did on occasion, that was too much. And I even considered it sometimes dangerous because things that you couldn't see could happen. And when it's a little smaller, you can see more. But um, 25, I, I personally would prefer all the littler kids have lower class size. No question about it. But until we get some balance at the high school level, where we still run a whole lot of classes at 20, where they could be bigger, I mean, so the class policy that existed exists exists now, but it is not in contract, nor should I hope that it ever be, and it, it, it is something that should be discussed. <clears throat> I, I think we should have a further discussion on this because I agree with many of the things that you said. In fact, I was talking to Joy and I came across a draft of an addendum to the Class Size Committee report, which we're trying to figure out if that was ever adopted by the school board, which basically said, it, depending on when, if you go over the class size limit, there shall be a teacher aid as opposed to sending a child to a school other than the home school. And I agree with you and, and I've, I supported that. I, I think you wrote that, That's, and I don't think it was approved. I, well, <laughs> that would explain it. Which, which would explain why you're in so much agreement with it. True, but for some reason, I, hopefully we could find maybe in the year 2000 it was. Um, I just have this well, for whatever reason, I but, just But we should, have the, we should have the discussion on that because right, I think it's a terrible that. thing. To, it, it, to, well, it's timely given what we're going to look at. Right, let's do that. It, it is interesting to note that if you take the, the notion that the child who is the one exceeding the class size that would exceed, and you put that child to a different class, what you are doing also is putting that child typically to a class which is smaller. So rather than being the new kid in a class of 31, being the 31st kid in a class of 31, that child may wind up being the 23rd kid in a class of 23, which as a new kid, right. make. so, so, so it, it, there are pros and cons right. to the So for the family is the, that I, was my example, to move the fifth grader, it's going to be hard for that fifth grader to go anywhere because all the fifth graders pretty much know each other. First graders, Mel while Brown. some of them have been in kindergarten, a lot of them have been, have been in private kindergarten, a whole bunch of them don't know each other. And um, I, I don't know, I, they don't seem to know each other anyhow. They, they come out of kindergarten, they see each other after two months, and it's like, oh, a new toy. You know, they just don't really always recognize that they're among strangers. And so they're more malleable to what you're going to do with them. They'll mm -hmm. just go. The older ones, it's harder. Yes. And, and pushing them out of what is their home school for one or two kids. You know, you, the parents came away from the settlement table, put down their money, came to the school, and we're um, finding out that the education they thought they paid for wasn't what they're going to get. Still going to be good. They were happy overall, but still pretty human experience that they had. So this is the other thing I wanted to talk about about that. Can I do that now? Is this. Apparently when these, and, and there may be, you know, he said, she said, this said, that said, we don't know the truth of all, maybe what happened, but this is the deal. They were first told that in order to register a child here, they had to have moved in, had settlement, had their settlement papers, a bill maybe, they were in. When they did do that, they, they didn't register at the time they purchased the house, the agreement of sale. They registered at settlement. Apparently when they registered at settlement, somebody told them, gee, why didn't you do this earlier? You could have registered when you had your agreement of sale. Maybe your kid would have gotten in. Well, that poor family went berserk. So what exactly is the rule? At what point can a family register their child here? What do they need to have in their hands to register? Uh, this is timely for now because houses are going for sale. A family can register at the time of a signed uh, agreement of sale or lease presented to us. Speak up. We can't hear. Hey, how about now? No? Just get louder. 
Okay. <laughs> use your teacher voice. A, yeah, use your, your... A family can register in the district at the time of providing us a signed agreement of sale or a signed lease. They can then finalize registration upon moving into the district, taking residence, and providing four proofs of residency. Prior to that, though, those students are placed into a classroom. Um, in this particular case, would have been considered one of the numbers in a particular grade level at their home school. So I'll say for me, I think um, that at June 1st, and we're at 27, um, and, and I don't know, maybe this is too anecdotal, but I've seen a lot of houses for sale. I think you're going to get more than three students. I would prefer to break up the classes. I don't, I don't really want to see 28, 29 kids in a first grade class, personally. So I, I'm all for adding the teacher as of June 1st. So if Einstone only has three kids over, it, it's a little more questionable. I'm going to go with your professional judgment that you think you're going to have enough kids. Um, I wouldn't want to see a class under 20, um, but I didn't personally experience, but have talked to parents whose kids have gone to other schools and then come back. And while I think going into first grade isn't a big deal, fortunately, when I was exposed to us, there were a couple kids and they went to a neighboring school and then they came back into second grade into the school where my kids were. But it, it, it wasn't the easiest transition for one of them. And I think for right now that we can provide those two. Now that's not to say we're not going to get to August and some other school's going to need it and we're not going to have to have a kid go to a neighboring school, you know. But for right now, for me, I'm willing to go for these two teachers. I mean, from my memory, this situation is presenting itself a little bit earlier than it normally does. That's correct. So the reality is if these kids had registered um, just a couple of weeks ago, it would have been in your budget and it wouldn't be an extra item because it would have naturally broken and that position would have been part of the budget, correct? Well, not this year, because this is the first year we did not have teachers in reserve. We always had two to three teachers in reserve in our budget, but we, we did not do that this year. So normally... No, but it wouldn't have even have been in the reserve. I mean, if they had registered early for some, or you knew that they were coming in earlier, and you would have anticipated that by June already you were five That's students right. over in a single That's school, right. you never would have planned for three sections. You would have right from the start planned for four. And, you know, I spent enough time uh, in the Rolling Hills office. I mean, people register all the time. No, new people in the community don't necessarily think there's a sense of urgency because it's a public school district, and of course you're going to be able to register. It's not like... A private school that closes out. So, um, you know, I, I think it's an interesting uh, situation this year that it, it presented itself this much earlier in the calendar, and I agree with Wendy. If that's what's presenting now, I also think that you're underestimating the number of additional enrollments you're going to get. So I fully support this. Let me have two quick, two quick comments. One is for people who are following this and, and understanding the conversation, what you're seeing is an outgrowth of when you budget tightly. Uh, a small movement of one item may cause a ripple or, or, or an exception, and that's what you're seeing. So what you're seeing is an outgrowth. Had the budget had more large S, as it may have in the past years, or have been alluded to have in the past years, maybe this wouldn't occur. So that's one. The second point is really to the public. Uh, I want to be very clear, and this will come up more based on some of the presentations. We have three presentations today. There is no contract that says the child in this house will go to that school. Uh, that real estate people will sometimes say, oh, you're in this sending district. That's not the school district saying that. That's a real estate person. The school district sends the child to where the education for that child is most appropriate within the district. If you're a child with disabilities, it might not be your home school. We're talking about sending a child to a different school. So I want to make clear to the, to the community, the district chooses the schools for the children as is most appropriate for the child and for the benefit of the entire school district. We'll talk about that. That will be a major topic of conversation should redistricting come onto the table, but it also comes in this place as well. Sorry, I've got somebody else. Okay. I just have two follow-up yep. questions. Uh, I don't see a projected cost. Do you have an, uh, any idea what the cost would be for each position? Are they both the same or? I, I guess they're both entry okay. level, so they'll probably yes. be the same. Yes. Yeah. You would look at master step zero would be. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is there another option? I know uh, 
Mr. Klein and I spoke about this a, a bit, but is there another option, bring another teacher from another school that maybe has under enrollment, if they have dual certification, or have you looked at that? Um, well, right now, uh, we started this process with, with 1.5 fewer teachers than we had let, than we have in this current year, based on what the numbers look like when we started this process. So all of our classes right now are pretty much, and our teachers are pretty much, I'm not, they're not full, but we don't, it's not like we have extra teachers right now. So it, I, can't, I don't have a teacher that I could move from another building to this building at the present time because um, all our current teachers in the budget are accounted for in terms of having uh, students and sections. Okay, thank you. We have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Block? Yes. Mr. Abramson? Yes. Mrs. Brooks? Yes. Mr. Bilek? Yes. Dr. Foster? Yes. Mr. Grubb? Yep. Yeah. Mrs. McKessie? Yes. Mrs. Sexton? Yes. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, items number two has a lot of motions. I'm going to ask that we take them two at a time. So uh, just for the sake of the person who's making the motion. So Dr. Foster, can you take the first two? Sure, thanks. I move to award the 2014-2015 number two fuel oil supply bid number 14-26 to Riggins Incorporated at a floating price of point one two eight dollars over the market rate subject to audit I move to award the 2014 2015 unleaded gasoline bid number 14-26 to Superior Plus Energy Services Incorporated at a floating price of point one seven dollars over the market rate subject to audit second Question. you want to decipher that Mr. Taylor <laughs> Well, basically, it's <clears throat> we get invoicing from a wholesaler or supplier, and they demonstrate that the um, delivery and whatever um, profit would be in their cost is that amount over that wholesale cost. So that's the bid price we approve is that margin over the wholesale cost. Correct. I, I mean, and these are large purchases according to what's written here, you know, 20,000 gallons of, of fuel oil and 15,000 gallons of unleaded gasoline. So, so these are not uh, the prices that, that we see at the pump w when we add to the whole cell price this point uh, one two. No, I think we, do, think we do a little better than you would right. see at the pump. And, and historically, we've done better than the IU's bids as well by going this route. Um, the problem with, if you were asking why wouldn't we consider that, is we generally don't use enough fuel to be considered as a part of that bulk a bid through the IU. Th it is a lot, but it's not a lot in the school world. Okay. So. In, in some um, winters, we would not use much fuel oil at all, correct? Correct. So we only pay for what we purchase, obviously. Yeah. And m most of these are on natural gas. It's the uh, it's a cutover from natural gas to oil when we reach certain temperatures. Yes. Some schools that are all oil. Soul Soul Finestone and um, Brightstown. I would imagine. Brightstown. The a couple questions on this. The number two fuel oil. Um, is that? Well, let me ask the first, the second question first. Um, the unleaded gasoline bid. Are there are there state taxes in that, and do we get refunded those taxes? We are exempt from many of the taxes. There's a tax in there, I believe, that we have to pay. It's an excise tax or something like that. It might be a federal excise tax that we do have to pay. But most of the taxes are, are taken away, and that's why our rate is so much lower. So when when Bill says this isn't the rate we pay at the pump, this is not only not the rate we pay at the pump because the pump owner at the gas station has a profit, but also because that pump owner is paying yes. those, ta those state taxes. Is that the question regarding the fuel oil supply um, really relates to the question of uh, number two fuel oil and, and diesel fuel are often uh, equivalent, are they not? They are generally thought to be equivalent. Similar. So my question is, um, is this also the fuel oil that is running uh, our generators? We have diesel generators? around the district? Or is this not because, again, that excise tax for 
vehicles, diesel, diesel meant for on-the-road vehicles pays a hefty excise tax of the federal government, and diesel meant for not road purpose, which would include number two fuel oil in large measure, has a dye inserted into it to detect it if it were reused on a commercial setting, but it is not subject to those taxes, even the excise tax. I What's believe we used to purchase diesel separately from the purchase of uh, number two fuel oil to put in our generators, because that's one of the costs we had when uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, came through and we had to keep the generator at LSAC down. We had to make purchases of diesel fuel to put in the generator. Okay, we can't use number two fuel oil. Um, I, I'd actually have to investigate that response yeah. because All I right, think I, what happened is we actually ran short on number two fuel oil and we do use number two fuel oil and I think that we ran short because of the demand for fuel oil when we right. had the Sandy event and we had to go out and purchase additional because we couldn't get the supply that we couldn't get the okay. supply that we need. Yeah, I just, just want to make sure that we're not paying excess taxes for over the road taxes that we don't need to pay. That, that's what I'm interested in. These I'm only referring over the road to Sandy. Uses. I remember that we had a problem. That's why it came into that mix. All right. Any other questions? Okay, can we have a vote, roll call vote? Okay. Let's see here. Mr. Abramson? Yes. Mrs. Brooks? Mrs. Brooks stepped out for a moment. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Mr. Bilek? Yes. Dr. Foster? Yes. Mr. Grupp? Yes. Mrs. McKessie? Yes. Mrs. Sexton? Yes. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Block? Yes. So I'm just going to ask the board one, one thing. Um, so we have a lot of these motions tonight. If you ask questions, if you're then good with it, if you let me know, then I'll do the unanimous consent. But if you ask questions you don't say, then I think you might want to vote no. So I want to certainly give you that privilege. So if we, we'll move a little faster. I know you. You are all very excited to stay here and do all these motions, but. So moving on, Mr. Biley, could you take the next two? I move to award the 2014-2015 propane supply bid number 14-27 to Suburban Propane LLP at a fixed price of $2.766 per gallon subject to audit. Second. Keep going. I move to award 2014-15 to 2016-2017 Waste Removal Recycling Services, bid number 14-28 at Goodnow Hillcrest, Newtown, Richborough, Rolling Hills, Solfine Stone, and Wrightstown Elementary Schools to Solid Waste Services doing business as J.P. Mazzucaro and Sons at a total cost not to exceed $162,252 subject to audit. I'll, I'll second the two together. <laughs> Thank you. Questions or did, did you have anything? No. The propane is pretty self-explanatory. If you want to get into the, the second motion on trash collection, I think it's self-explanatory. What I will say for those is that I looked at each school individually, and we awarded those to three different contractors based upon, three different vendors based upon their low combined for blocks of building. So we didn't just give it to one person. We saved monies by splitting that bid up. So the only question I have about uh, this uh, this motion here is the award to uh, Mazzucaro for the recycling. I happen to know that Lex has a recycling program that rebates back um, for the amount of recyclables that you, that you put into the system. Does that apply to the school district or is that only for residential? And was that added to the equation if it applies? I'm sorry, who, who offers that? Lex. 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 Um, I, mean, I could take a look, but I don't think that that would affect the actual overall bid results. They, okay. didn't, they didn't demonstrate to me the savings in their bid and, and how it would um, offset their, uh, their total amount to us. Okay. So I will research yeah, it for the future, it. I though. see it later, but I, I, just in reference to the entire, and that's probably right. a drawback of breaking it up like that, but Sorry. that's okay. Oh. Any concerns? No. Okay. So I'm going to ask that the secretary record those motions as passing by unanimous consent. Uh, Mrs. Brooks, can you take the next two? I move to award the 2014-15 to 2016-17 yeah. to waste removal recycling bid number 14-28 at Council Rock High School North and South, Holland, Newtown, and Richboro Middle Schools, Churchville, Holland, and Maureen M. Welch Elementary Schools, the Chancellor Center, and LSAC, 
for waste management of PA at a total cost not to exceed $273,837.87 subject to audit. I move to award 2014-15 to 2016-17 waste removal recycling bid 14-28 at 20 Ford Road Maintenance Facility to George Leck and Sons Incorporating doing business as Leck Waste Services at a total cost not to exceed $4,520.52 subject to audit. Second. Questions, comments? Hearing no objection, I ask the secretary to record the motion as passing with unanimous consent. Mr. Abramson, can you read the next two and last two for item number two? I move to award 2014-2015 gym and other wood floor refinishing bid maintenance and services bid number 14-29 at Newtown Middle School to Robert Myers Company, Inc. at a total cost not to exceed $3,072 subject to audit. And I move to award 2014-2015 gym and other wood floor refinishing bid maintenance and services bid number 14-29 at Council Rock High School North and South, Holland Middle School, Newtown Rolling, Newtown Rolling Hills, Marine M. Welch, and Churchville Elementary Schools to Mastercraft Sports Flooring, Inc. at a total cost not to exceed $18,175 subject to order. Second. Questions? Mm, Presentation. On the, on the North and South, if this comes up, I never remember. The, they're not repainting. They're, they're, what are they doing? They're, they're <laughs> basically screening and refinishing. Um, so the, they'll, 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 they'll repair lines. They screen if there's lines that are damaged. They'll repair the lines and then they'll recoat the floor. So the, this the is not a total sand and refinish. The logos in the middle are, will be touched if required, but they'll be Correct. the same as they are. <laughs> About every seven years, five to seven years, we would do an actual sanding, repainting kind of right. project. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Is there an objection? Okay, hearing no objection, I ask the secretary to record the motions as passing with unanimous consent. Mrs. McKessie, can you take item number three? I move to approve the independent service contract for the Power Factor Correction Project at Rolling Hills Elementary School to LPG Group Energy Consultants at a cost not to exceed $22,445 subject to audit. Second. Can you just do a quick overview <laughs> and update on this stuff? Sure. Yeah, this was reviewed back at the uh, at May facilities meeting, but um, it's something that I've spoken with um, about to Aramark um, in considering a power factor correction, which basically is some equipment at the head end of the electrical service that cleans up the, the, the power coming into the building and, and helps eliminate spikes and surges within the building that challenge the motors within the equipment. So when they're seeing those it's uh, equivalent to if you were getting a shower at home and someone turns the water on somewhere else in the house and you get that um, impact to the flow of the water. It's similar to what it does to the power in a building. It actually maintains a constant power supply and doesn't have those little um, surges and spikes. So what it does is extend the life of the equipment throughout the building. Um, for example, at this building, we're averaging about a compressor a year on the roof in the rooftop equipment which cost us about ten thousand dollars by the time we go through the maintenance to replace it and do what we have to do um, this project alone um, is being considered there's ten projects that were recommended by this vendor we said look let's take the project that's one of the least expensive projects that shows the quickest potential payback and see how this process actually works if we do demonstrate the savings that they're saying and the payback timeline that they're saying, then it's something that we should more seriously consider throughout the district at other buildings where we have much bigger paybacks, but the first time costs are higher. So for example, this is, as it says, 22,445. Um, if you consider the equipment um, damage and not replacing equipment in the first year, the payback's even 14 months. Um, if not, it's two years. Um, there's, there's, we can demonstrate those savings, and if we do realize those savings, there's nine other buildings that we could consider, with the first time cost being about $236,000. The annual savings, however, is about $107,000. So we would pay the rest of those projects back in two years, and then realize about $107,000 savings on, on power throughout those buildings as a result of this. So it's something that we're going to... Um, monitor at this building and then see what we want to do for the future. 
if the if the if the electrical loads at the building were changed because the 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 use of the building were changed, would would this unit still have sufficient capacity? I, I, yeah, because I think the size of the building and now if you're talking about um, significant use changes, you know, maybe not, but I think that even if we are considering something down the road as a result of what the planning teams have talked to us about tonight, I don't think it would be implemented within the next year or two. It would take us time to address those issues. So I think that this equipment would still be, um, we'd, we'd serve the life of it. I mean, we'd see the life cycle payback and we would certainly pay for it. Um, you know, at zero cost by the time we implement something at that building. Thanks. You know, I... Suppose something were implemented in that building in three years. Would it pay for, pay itself back? Yeah, I mean, the payback, if you, if we, if we were, um, is 27 months. So we're going to, the payback on this is basically two years. So if we did something in three, we would see a payback, plus we'd see a year of savings um, to the district. And really what I want to see is in the first year, if we're seeing half the savings they're talking about, then I know that we're probably onto something that has a lot of legitimacy that we should consider doing elsewhere. So I really want to see on one of the lower costing projects after the first year, if we've seen those half of those savings. And in the second year, if we've seen all those savings, then we definitely want to consider doing a bigger project with this, this product. You know, in the, in the back, as a kid, in the back of popular science, they used to sell these little discs that you'd put underneath the incandescent bulbs. And they used to say it prevents the electricity from surging into the bulb and burning out, and it makes them last longer. That was assuredly hokum. I, I hope that this is not. And, and, but my question, a couple of questions around that is, when we've replaced compressors in what we would say is premature in a premature nature. Have those been subject to insurance claims, or are they just the cost of doing business? It's the cost of doing business. Most of those units are, are older and tired, and if you actually looked at um, you know, the wear and tear and you were to prorate the, the age of the equipment, I don't think you'd see much based on that prorated cost. So the little discs in the back of the popular science magazine never gave any guarantees. You just bought them, spent the money, and hoped for the best. Yeah. Are they making any representation here in terms of, one, I was, I was going to ask if, if we would get some break on our insurance because potential for a claim would be less because of controlling surges. So I don't know if that's been explored, but are they making any representation to us um, <coughs> that is demonstrable or that we'll be able to look at and say it didn't meet our expectations and to take a refund or we're just putting the money out? I, and I, I am not. It is not my intention to claim that they are that that this is a smoke and mirrors hokum type thing, but I don't know. Well, it's a, it's a good question, and thanks for pointing it out. There is a one year, one hundred percent money back guarantee from this company on the product. So if after a year we don't see the savings that they're telling us, or at least half the payback, the life cycle cost, they're claiming that they would um, refund the monies for the project. They're confident in their product. It's been used at at the new Dallas Cowboys football stadium. It's been used as some significant uh, facilities. So this isn't something that this guy's going around just selling a couple school districts. He's using this at some significant buildings. Um, there's also a 10-year warranty on the product. And if we'd see a power surge and this thing were to protect everything within the building and this equipment failed within those 10 years, they come back and replace the equipment. So just so we're clear, and, and Bill's more of a statistician around this type of thing than I am, we have 10 units. We average one a year. Uh, gee, the p-value here, Bill, is going to be hard to calculate because the of insufficient. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Which, which is what I'm getting to, which is that the the will we have the failure or not? One in ten stick the thing up. It's already 50-50. You know, just one year you have two, one year you have zero. I, I appreciate they offer the. You know, it's not. It it, it is. On the scope of our budget, it is not a major number. If it if it has a potential to bear fruit, good. Let's take a look at it. And if in the next two years we wind up going two or three on compressors on that, I think we're probably going to back out. I would agree. Okay. I think that's where you started. 
Anyone else? Are you okay? Uh, I ask the secretary to record the motion as passing with unanimous consent. And we're on to item number four. Thank you. Um, which I'm going to ask Mr. Block. I move to award the 2014-2015 medical and athletic medical supply bid number 14-05 to the vendors listed in the low acceptable bid column at a total cost not to exceed $43,964.06 subject to audit. And I move to award the 2014-2015 athletic supply and equipment bid number 14-09 to the vendors listed in the low acceptable bid column at a total cost not to exceed $146,933.68 subject to audit. Second. Questions for Mr. Reinhardt in these bids? I'm, I'm going to abstain on this one. Just for the, I, I normally look at these in greater detail and I just, in the sizes of this agenda, I didn't get to look at it at the detail I would normally look at. It. So I'll, just, I'll abstain on this one. Okay. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? It's, a, it's overwhelming to look at. I, I spent some time looking at these lists. They're very long. <laughs> There's, you, you know, how can you be sure that, that, that the best choice has been made, that, that it's not over inventoried, uh, you know, what happened to the material last year? It's just, it, it's a lot of, of stuff to be ordered. So I hope that people are making good choices uh, when this material is ordered and keeping track of it and, you know, making sure it doesn't evaporate and um, anyway. To, to, to that point, Dr. Foster, just, uh, you know, I look at this stuff, but I don't need to read it. I, I believe that we have hired good administrators and they are overseeing each other. And I, at some point when we're down to $1.99 on a two hundred and $15 million budget, I, you know, it's, if I ask them questions, the time they spend and what we pay them isn't worth it. So you ha I, I agree with you. You have to have some level. It's good to question some of the things that stand out and different ones of us pick another, but I agree with you. It's a big, it's a lot to look at. If I mean, I, I did question two items on the list and I got two yeah. good good answers yeah. back. So, yeah. you know, I think we all do that and it's it's a way to make sure that everything's going as it should. Agreed. Right. Doug, so Mr. Reinhardt me. wanted to speak. There's just, I just want to make sure you know there's a process and we involve the coordinators or the trainers in this situation quite a bit where they put in the quantities and we go out and do the bid and they get the second look at it and then they adjust the quantities. So I do believe that they get two looks at it. Um, I will tell you, I don't have it with me here, but there are items that last year they purchased, this year they don't <coughs> purchase. So there are that, I expect that they've done an inventory and say we need this this year, we don't need this. So. For, for me, what I wind up doing with this is, first of all, uh, that it's in Excel makes my life tremendously <laughs> easier. Because what I wind up doing with it is I flip it a couple different ways. I normally, I didn't have a chance. I normally look at what the most expensive items are. I normally look at those items that, well, that we've spent the most money on just because of the number of items. This is how last time when we looked at it, we found out we're spending 35% of our audiovisual budget is batteries. It's interesting to me to look at it in that sense, and that's the only reason. Bill, the only exception I find on some things historically was that occasionally we had uh, differentiation between two buildings ordering the same item, which then prompts me to wonder why was one acceptable one building, what it wasn't acceptable at the other, sort of actually going back to the same as Denise's question before, which is how come one trip is more expensive than the other? I, I'm looking for those answers. That's what I'm upsetting. I, I don't doubt the process. It's just I didn't have the chance to look and make the analysis of the questions I always like to make. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mrs. Brooks? Yes. Mr. Bilek? Yes. Dr. Foster? Yes. Mr. Grupp? I'll abstain. Uh, Mrs. McKessie? Yes. Mrs. Sexton? Yes. Mrs. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Block? Yes. Mr. Abramson? Yes. Mrs. Sexton, can you take item number five? What was ah. the second? Dirk, is this the one you want to subject to the uh, solicitor? <coughs> If, if uh, the board doesn't mind, I don't think we um, had seen the base contract, which um, the materials we 
looked at um, refer to. Um, so, so if you could approve it subject to solicitor approval, that's probably. Um, okay. That's my suggestion. Mrs. This Sexton? One? Yes. Okie doke. I move to approve Sun Life Assurance Company to provide short and long term disability insurance as well as basic life, supplemental life, and accidental death and dismemberment insurance and other insurances as in ca contained in the attachment to this agenda, subject to order, audit and solicitor review. Second. Second. Ms. Trioli, will you speak to this? Earlier this, earlier this school year, we worked with our partners at Gallagher Benefit Services to take a look at some other providers for our disability insurances and our life insurance. Myself, um, Mr. Reinhardt, and our senior representatives from Gallagher met with Sun Life, with Cigna, who was our previous carrier, and with MetLife, where they um, came in and they did presentations to us to show us what uh, our current lines of coverage would look like if we moved over to, to them. So after um, we had the initial presentations, we then narrowed it down to Cigna and Sun Life, who then returned and came back and gave a more detail uh, presentation to us and we were so impressed with what Sun Life had to offer. They um, are giving us a reduction in our rates. We have a savings of approximately 67400 with a three-year guarantee. So in addition to saving a small amount of money in the larger scheme of things, we feel like we're also going to increase the level of service that we have for the same lines of coverage that exist today. We had had um, some issues with Cigna during our relationship with them. Both associations had expressed an interest and a support for changing carriers, and we're just extremely pleased with what we've seen from Sun Life. In addition to the cost savings, we just see some capabilities that we didn't have with our previous carrier. Their online portal for both the administrator and for the employee is robust user-friendly. I think the ease of administration and the efficiency of administration of these lines of coverage are going to improve as well. So it just, um, we feel like it's a very positive change with a little to no impact on the employee and um, some savings for the district too. Have a question? question? Yes, Mr. Bailick. So what part of these uh, this policy is paid by the district and which parts are paid by the uh, employees? So um, the, district offer, the district offers core level of short-term disability, core level of long-term disability, and a core level of life insurance to all employees who are benefit eligible. So if you would like to have a higher level of disability, you have to complete what's called an evidence of insurability form that goes to the carrier who then the underwriting evaluates and then the employee pays for that higher level of coverage and supplemental life insurance is the same as well how high the level of coverage that you can obtain varies depending on the bargaining unit that you're in so when you look at the premium sheets and even when you look at the contract document it's lengthy it's cumbersome it's complex because our lines of coverage are complex there's there's different um, offerings for different members of our bargaining units. So the base amounts are uh, consistent with the collective bargaining agreements? Yes. No, no, it's fine. It, so am I assuming correctly that the optional life, dependent optional life, and I guess that's the only one that the employee, or the only two that the employees would pay for themselves? You know, the employees also pay for higher level of short-term disability coverage beyond the core so and the higher level of long-term disability beyond the core. Great. So if you're looking for additional insurance, it's a nice piece that we offer that to you, but it is at your expense. Thank you. Other questions? Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. So I ask the secretary to record the motion as passing by unanimous consent. And we are at item number six, Mr. Grupp. I move to approve the depositories of record for the 2014-15 school year as contained in this attachment. Second. Ms. Okay. Reinhardt, where are we going to put our money? Yes, um, as you will see, or if you remember in past years, it was a much more robust uh, group of uh, banks that uh, 
actually saw our money and we uh, competitively look to go out for that. But uh, the banks wanting our money has dried up quite a bit. So we are a very small amount compared to what it was. Some of the uh, banks listed here are, are paying agent for our bond issues and things like that that you will see. But uh, if you have any questions, I can try to answer them. Yeah, they're not um, telling us no because they don't like us. They're telling us no because it costs them too much to hold the amount of money we're giving them, correct? Anything over FDIC, they have to pull, pull collateral. And some banks price that differently than other banks. And they may say it's 25 basis points just to pull the collateral. And if they do that, they have no yield to give us. And they really don't want our money. I have a question for the solicitor. So, Derek, what are we approving? With, with <coughs> You're approving depositories in which uh, district funds can be deposited. So, our, from a fiduciary standpoint, is, are, are, are we saying then that these banks and other institutions meet the, the criteria that we set to hold our money? Statutory. The, the, you're, you're saying that the, these meet the statutory requirements for a school district depository, which is essentially that they be a bank or a trust, or a trust, and that um, the security and there be a specific security for the deposits of the school district, which is what um, Mr. Klein was just speaking to. They have to be. Uh, collateralized by government securities uh, to the amount of 120% of the face value of the uh, deposit. 102%. Well, it's 102, but then if you look at Act 72 is what requires it. And you're allowed to, they're allowed to use par value based on the type of investment it is as opposed to the market value. So it gets convoluted if you really want to talk about it. Most banks, go beyond that and say we're going to market to market daily and that's what you'd like to see but that isn't a requirement of the law and just so we're clear this is not obligating the district to put funds in these this is opening the door to allow the district to put funds in these banks Correct. right these, these organizations yes this can is this a be limit. amended I'm sorry. I'm can this be amended throughout the year so if another bank comes forward and says we'd like to have i would bring it to you for okay. your approval yeah, I think Wilmington Trust was bought by Wilmington M Trust and T, uh, M &T, right? That might be M and T. I'm, I'd have to look again. It's a paying agent of ours. We right. don't have money there. We deposit money with them when the, a uh, payment for a bond issues due, and then they pay it to the registered bondholders. But they hold our money for a short period of time. Right. So they're deposit. Yeah. Any other questions? Everybody? No, okay. I, I'm, okay. I'm uncertain because of my concern about how much money we hold in um, uh, not as much the banks, but Pliget funds. So I'm just. Okay, I, well, I feel roll a, call. Okay, fine. That's well, I'm just trying to okay, work through the question. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Actually, I, I just don't know if that conflicts stop. with my concerns of um, approving the depository. Well, I guess so the question. If anyone has any comments. I'm just call. trying to think of help. You mm -hmm. know, I appreciate that it. it's. It's not saying how much we would put there. It's that we would put anything there. So even if we put a dollar there, if you agree that we could put a dollar there, then, then it would probably be appropriate to vote yes. But that ultimately comes down to your comfort level. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Or do you have more questions? No, you know, I'm okay with it. Uh, given that explanation and help that Jerry just gave me, I'm okay with it. Okay. We'll ask that the motion be recorded as passing with unanimous consent. And I believe, Ms. Brooks, you're up for item number seven. I move to award the 2014-15 IT equipment bid number 14-31, category one, desktop computer Dell small form factor, category two, laptop computer Dell, category three, Meraki wireless access points, category six, Fujitsu storage DX440 upgrade, Category 7, Splunk Enterprise Security, including installation slash configuration to ask technologies, Inc., at a total cost not to exceed $899,557, subject to audit. 
I move to reject the 2014-15 IT equipment bid number 14-31, category 8, Fujitsu blade server chassis and blades, category 9, Apple computer slash quantity 1 slash no bid received, category 11, <coughs> Fluke Networks test equipment fiber inspector, no bid received, category 12, Fluke Networks test equipment link runner at network tester, no bid received. I move to award the 2014-15 IT equipment bid number 14-31, category 10A, to CH CHSC at a total cost not to exceed $35,964, subject to audit. I move to award the IT equipment bid number 14-31, category 10B, to Technology Exchange as a credit to the district of $51,198.32 and, and at no additional cost to the district. Oop, one more. I move to award the 2014-15 SmartNets bid number 14-32 to Presidio Network Solutions for an amount not to exceed $46,097.69, <coughs> subject to audit. Second. Questions for Mr. Fredrickson? Matt, a lot of discussion earlier this evening from, from the three panels. Uh, speaking about bring your own device, my, my impression is that a lot of this 802.1x is, is necessary in, in part to position us to go forward with that, or am I wrong? That's correct. So uh, that, that's the large portion of this. Unrelated to this, possibly, um, let me ask it now, and, and if, if not now, we can cover it later. In, in 99-2000, maybe, 99-2000, the district entered into a long-term agreement with an organization to purchase dark fiber. I think there were six dark fibers that ran around the district in various locations. Certainly it was, it was a precursor to anything that was going on. There was no fiber in the community. Now there is fiber in the community from Verizon and other high-speed capacities. Are we still using those same, that same, it was dark fiber at the time. It was actually put up on poles uniquely through the district. Are we still using and part of that contract? That's correct. We still have a contract with them. Um, I believe it has two years left. I have to double check. At the end of that two years, we will be going out to bid um, because at the time, you're right, there weren't enough providers in the area to give competitive bids for the product. But now there are, and it's part of our E-rate process. So at the, end of the, at the conclusion of the contract, which was renewed, um, we'll most likely go out to bid for those services. That's fine. I, and I appreciate that. And at some point, if we could just get a, a, a forward look on that from you through, through Mr. Klein's office in the next few months, that would be great. Just what are we talking about? It's an old thing. It's historical. Just let us know so we're a little prepared. But sorry to bring it up on this, but it, I wondered if it related at all to this. It really has no bearing on this at all. Okay. Thanks. Uh, other comments or questions? Mr. Abramson? So Category 12, you your memo says you're going to rebid, and then category nine and 11, where no bids were received. What, what's happening with those? We sent out the bid to 15 or 20 vendors, and it was posted on the, the internet as well. We just didn't get any bids. Are, are you going to rebid those? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, the Apple computer, we probably will not rebid. Um, Apple doesn't really offer any discounts. Yeah, you can't bid out. Bid. You really can't. Single source, so we'll probably use a Papam or CoStar's vendor. And I want to make a comment for Bob Reiner, and kind of, uh, uh, to be fair, because I'm always chasing you guys about trucks and saying, how come, you know, how come we're specifying a truck? And in this event, I'm looking at this, and I'm not raising, saying boo, about we're specifying specific pieces of equipment. In part, just to give you some insight into my thinking, this, this is part of a network, and each part depends on the other. We've seen a couple of years ago when uh, Chuck Lambert's predecessor brought a piece of equipment, turned it on, and brought the entire network down. Um, so it's, it's a it's predecessor. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Maybe it was you. But no, it was. So that's why I'm less concerned about vendor specificity on, on, on this sort of bit. Those items are unique and distinct, um, you know, like a truck or standalone piece of equipment. That's my rationale. All right, any other comments or questions? Any concerns? Okay, I ask the secretary to record the vote, the motion as passing by unanimous consent. Um, 
Hmm. I've lost track. <laughs> Mr. Bilek, did you read one recently? Andy needs one. Andy's been doing me to take them all. Okay, Mr. <laughs> I'll take them all. Mr. Bull, <laughs> go for it. Item number eight's all yours. I move to renew the 2014 Are we not doing item? Did we do the, the smart nets? Yeah. Yes, that was part Sorry, of that. I missed. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm still fine. I just okay. Uh, go ahead. I move to renew the 2014-2015 property liability crime insurance package to ACE-PSBA at a total cost not to exceed $257,369, subject to audit. And I move to renew the 2014 boiler machinery insurance policy to Hartford Steam Boiler at a total cost not to exceed $11,034, subject to audit. I move to renew the 2014-2015 automobile insurance policy to ACE-PSBA at a total cost not to exceed $31,119, subject to audit. I move to renew the 2014-2015 School Leaders Errors and Omissions Insurance Policy to PSBA-Old Republic at a total cost not to exceed $112,928, subject to audit. I move to renew the 2014-2015 excess liability insurance policy to PSBA slash Old Republic at a total cost not to exceed $36,247 subject to audit. I move to renew the 2014-2015 workers compensation policy to PMA at a total cost not to exceed $837,583 subject to audit. I move to renew the 2014-2015 student accident insurance policy to people's benefit life at a total cost not to exceed $35,076 subject to audit. I move to renew the 2014-2015 faithful performance bond issuance policy to F&D slash Zurich at a total cost not to exceed $8,925 subject to audit. I move to renew the 2014-2015 public official bonds to F&D slash uh, Zurich at a total cost not to exceed $316 subject to audit. And I finally move to renew the 2014-2015 cyber liability insurance to Westchester dash PSBA slash ACE at a total cost not to exceed $19,857 subject to audit. Second. Mr. Reinhardt. Um, I will tell you, this year has been a very uneventful year as comparison to last year, if you remember all the different considerations we had to uh, make last year because of uh, premiums going up. We got rid of non-monetary damages in our errors and omissions policy. We went to a, or that one be two years ago, where we went to a retrospective plan for our workers' compensation. But this year, the premiums are coming in very um, minor increases. Um, I will tell you that the decision we made for workers' compensation, the amount that I show up there, the uh, uh, $837,000, is really the high point of the premium. We pay the premium first, and then we get a retrospective plan where if our experience stays low, uh, we would get uh, actually refunds back. And for the 2012 year, we're running where we got $341,000 back. So although we paid $800,000 out, we got, we're going to be getting $341,000 back. I got 50% of that back already. And 2013, the way we're running right now, um, we look that we will be getting about $440,000 back. So we're running very well with these programs. So I think the decision we made, along with Pace and Noe, uh, helping us through that have been uh, very good. So we're going to continue with the retrospective plan with PMA. Um, any other questions, I can definitely answer them. I'll try to answer them. Did, did you provide us documentation as to the policy limits? And, and the, the uh, um, retain, what the, what the I would call deductible. Uh, you know what? Term. I got to look to make sure if it wasn't on there. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. Well, it's on the schedule that I always give you guys. And well, we had we th these are all renewals, so we approved uh, last year the the actual policies that would have had that same information. Right. Yes. And uh, and because I guess Bob, we said but because Bob, you, you told me that th these renewals are the same terms and conditions and deductibles yes. and amounts. No deductibles are changed. Policies. But. Uh, I understand what uh, Mr. Grupp's saying, and I didn't give you the uh, 
any of that information and, on. And we used to get a, a binder, kind of a burgundy cover from Pastanoe. Which that binder has not been completed yet. Okay. Uh, I, you know, two, two aspects of this insurance, which, which I'm probably more familiar with than I care to be, but which interests me. One, this board a few years ago moved forward with the student accident uh, insurance, which, uh, you know, I, I just need to reinforce, I, it's, a, it's a brilliant idea. We, we are now in a time when people have lost jobs and may be unemployed and may not have insurance for their children. Uh, and if the child is injured at school, uh, due to a school-related activity, this will provide coverage if the parents' insurance won't. So I think that's appropriate. The other one that I was interested to know more about was the cyber liability. Specifically, I was interested to know, and I, you could give me the information outside of here, regarding event management. Uh, we don't deal with a lot of uh, financial information that we would lose, but our requirements in terms of managing an event should we have a, a breach, uh, it comes about in large measure because when we look at how common breaches have become, uh, targets recent exposure. So while I believe that our coverage is the same as last year, I want to look at that again with a little bit of an eye to see in light of the, where the uh, nature of, of computing has gone in the past year, the breaches, are we appropriately covered? So we can look at that if you provide that. If, if, if we talk about it in finance, uh, about whether it's sufficient, we can also increase that amount if we think it's appropriate. I'll agree with this now, but I would I'd like to get that consideration. I will that, make sure you get the packet that uh, we have that Thanks. has not been prepared. Anyone else? I, I just noticed that uh, the number eight at the top uh, changed June 30th, 2014 to June 30th, 2015. And the heading of number eight. Yeah, it's not a Yeah, that would no, be it's top. Not a motion, but just for yeah. future reference. Well, I thought you would have picked up that the second one for boiler machinery didn't have an end date. It only says 2014 dash. Would you like to modify the motion? Could you read it again? All of them? No, <laughs> just say you'll modify the second one to say 2015 as the end date. I will modify the second one to 2015 as the end date. And it, who seconded? I did. Yeah. Is that okay with you, yes, Mr. Bilek? Thank you very much. Okay, do we have any, are we, are, any other questions, comments? Okay, hearing no objection, I will ask the secretary to record item number eight motions as passing by unanimous consent. Uh, moving on to the solicitor's report, which I believe was sent to us just before the meeting. I'll any answer comments? any questions. I don't have any comments. I don't think you've had any exec sessions that I know about. Okay. I don't, and don't so. intend one this evening. Could, no? could you? Uh, not here, but maybe briefly update us after this uh, executive regarding litigation. Um, there, there was a item. I, I put it back to Mark. I put it back to Rob uh, about the impact of something. Bob, you saw my question to you. You commented that Rob Cox would be the one to respond. We haven't heard back, and it would be at an executive session topic. Do you have an update? And do you know what he's speaking of? I think. Okay, I know so we'll have a brief of. executive session after this. <coughs> Mr. Reed, were you able to get Mr. Klein the information I asked you for what what are our legal requirements in terms of closing a school building? I asked you last meeting. Right. Your your requirements are to um, hold a public hearing. Is there a date? How many public hearings? What? Are there rules around it? Is there a time? Do we have to give uh, six months, nine months lead time to close a building? Can we have a public meeting in June and not open a building in, uh, in September? Uh, in terms of the statute? Yes. You legal can. legal yeah. requirement. Yeah. yeah. The legal when? requirement is just, is just the hearing. And, and there may be a, um, I did not look at it between the time of the last hearing and now. And uh, Mr. Cox was supposed to be at tonight's meeting. Oh, and so, right. so <clears throat> we'll put that as a question for the planning committee to be answered at our next board meeting. Is that okay? Not for the planning committee to Not answer. Not for them to answer, I'm sorry. For but him to answer. For, for him to yeah. answer, but as one of the questions under 
the topic of I don't of care schools. how the questions come. I want right. the answer at the table here. I have that one, and there was another one. Oh, class size. I have two items to put under that, so that were asked during this meeting. So I will also follow up, make sure we have it. What, what did you say about class size? There was a request for a discussion on that, so I have a note to myself that we need to put that on an agenda and have a discussion. You and Mrs. Sexton said you wanted to. Right, and I don't know if it would fit into academic standards. No, I mean, we're going to have, we're going to meet all summer every Thursday night, or most Thursday nights all summer. Yes. Right? So, I mean, maybe it can be slotted part of one of those meetings to begin. But that's a long discussion, and it is something that impacts everything. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not a small item. I'm, I'm certainly not looking to toss it completely out, but I would like to see how it cannot cause other unintended consequences. Well, I think it's small, slightly related to the planning commission and things we've right. heard There's about a lot tonight, of things, right. as well as closing a building is. So my only intention was to say, we would distribute some facts about them, maybe like what our current policy is, and then this board will decide on a series of dates and times to, for further discussion. Is, is, that's what I thought. Is that? Well, yeah, actually, I was half tempted to ask that what I referred to earlier be put on the agenda. Um, uh, it's just a thought I had for board approval. Um, the, the amendment if it wasn't really approved by the board the class size committee report basically stating about a child not being sent to other than his home school if it means the class size uh, cap is exceeded uh, instead you have a teacher's aid so, so um, well if you send that to me I'll include it as part of the package but I don't know that we're ready for a motion we, there's been some requests for some discussion around the whole topic right but I expect that there will come a time I mean, hasn't already been approved by the board that I may ask that be put on the yeah, agenda. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's, it's not the time anyway, but another thing I would like to be put on the academic standards uh, agenda is a discussion with regard to points for pluses and maybe subtractions for minuses on um, the grade point average. Okay. So, well, we're up to board items. Are there other board's comments for tonight? I did. Well, I'll do it at the end. I have it. I just want to review the schedule that we have between now and the next meeting. I, I just had a, a really brief comment. So every three years, we, uh, I've been told by Mr. Taylor, we do the, the waste management contracts, which we voted on tonight. When you look in those, it was interesting for me to see the, the, the unit costs for trash that goes to landfill versus recycled materials. Uh, it looked like on average, it costs half as much for these companies to pick up recycled materials. I'd kind of hope that we'd actually get paid for it the way we do e-waste, but half is better than full price. So that was the first time that I personally had seen that just from a pure monetary perspective, um, recycling makes sense. And so we had an event um, right beforehand. I don't, I don't see any place to recycle these. In, right there. in the building, so is there, it's, it's not very well marked, because I've been in many events and these go straight into the trash. No, there's a green recycling bin out there. And, and, and then at other events I've been to, often there are uh, recycling containers. So I was at one recently at an elementary school where right into the dumpster everything went. So recycling is good, it saves us money. Very good. Anyone else? Yes, I'd like to supplement my solicitor's report. Section. 780 of the public school code says in the event of a permanent closing of a public school or substantially all of the school's facilities the board of school directors shall hold a public hearing on the question not less than three months prior to the decision of the board relating to the closing of the school and notice of the hearing shall be given in a newspaper of general circulation in the school district at least 15 days prior to the date of the hearing what so constitutes a hearing a meeting what, what constitutes closing a hearing yeah, it's a public meeting. Just a public meeting, okay. What constitutes closing? Uh, not well, letting reason, anybody in? Well, well no, 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 no. Because the reason I asked the question, the, the, the designation, the, the state PD, the public, the PD, whatever the heck that stands for, um, has a listing of primary and secondary schools in the state of Pennsylvania. And this building, for example, was delisted when we had a closing. It was delisted from that 
listing. It, it is no longer listed as a school in the state of Pennsylvania. So my question really came to be uh, that in, in some of the proposals made this evening, there were purposes, some of the school, some of the facilities were thought to be repurposed. And if they were going to be repurposed still as a school building, would it be necessary, even though you weren't using it in the intervening year, would it still be necessary to hold the closing the, this, this hearing? Or is it still a school building, it's still listed on PDE, and may return to being a school building? The reason I asked the question would be, I would, I am leery of delisting a building and then attempting to list the building again in that enlisting it as a new building, you may fall under certain categorizations such as minimum amount of space that you may delist a building that only had 13 acres and then choose to list it again as a school and now there's a requirement of PDE for 40 acres for an elementary school. So I want to be cautious. And, and while I'm not professing to know the law, this is why I pose the question, what constitutes closing a school? You don't need to have my answer tonight, but that's, that's my caution. Uh, okay. Any other comments? I just, uh, for any member of the community that's looking at the board calendar at the bottom of the agenda, uh, the finance and facilities meetings are, next ones are listed in July, but don't we have a meeting next week? Yes, so I will go over the agenda. I don't, I, I agree that's not correct, but I just, any other po public board comments before? Okay, so the agenda that we have set forth is next Thursday night, which is June 26th. There will be a facilities committee meeting, um, followed by an interviewing of which architects. Ar architects? Architects. I thought. Okay, architects. So July 3rd, we will uh, celebrate the country's uh, Independence Day, and would not have a meeting on July 3rd. So enjoy your Thursday off, co-board members. Um, July 10th will be a facilities meeting. And then it will be followed by our interviewing of construction managers. Construction managers. Um, July 17th will be a board meeting. And it will be at that board meeting that um, there will be an agenda item for us to discuss um, an outline of time frame of steps we'd like to take and how we'd like to move forward with this, the recommendations we've been given today. Um, and I've heard from several board members, just food for thought, that that timeline should include several community meetings after we decide whatever we decide or as we're deciding it. Um, so that would be one of the things on that July 17th agenda. On July 24th, I don't know the date. Well, it'll be seven days later. It will be um, a finance meeting and there are several items uh, for that including Pligit and Lerda. And, Lerda. Um, and we will at that point announce the topics for the next set of meetings. If anybody's concerned, they are on the website. But I just wanted to get for everyone's purposes. These are public meetings. Everyone is welcome. Um, everything but the board meeting will take, a uh, take place in the classroom. It will not um, be televised, so it's more of a committee atmosphere. Um, and we'd love for everyone to come. Any other comments? Anybody else has any other issues for this evening? Otherwise, I said this meeting's adjourned. No, you're not. Yeah. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Public comment. Oh my goodness, how could I forget that? I'm so sorry. I guess maybe, maybe one, just one comment as we close another school year. Um, congratulations to the administration staff. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on uh, finishing up another great year. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Public comment is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board. We would ask that you limit your comments to no longer than three minutes. Please consider the fact that there may be young children watching this broadcast live on CRTV when speaking. It's our goal to maintain a respectful environment so that members of our community have an equal opportunity to address the board without interruptions. While the board may welcomes your ideas and will consider them in deliberating an issue, we may not respond to your comments and your questions. Please approach and give your name if you'd like to speak. Yes, it's just me again. I'm sorry, I forgot, Nancy. I have a New Year's resolution. I have to well, lots of people talked about your new res okay. resolution today. Uh, Nancy Carroll, New Year's resolution is to keep talking about trailers until they come off. So, um, in that late last uh, 
meeting, I gave you a little uh, space utilization 101, which was if uh, you looked at these, these four rooms, or three rooms, and you'd say, there's no students in there, we can't put students in there. It's not used that way, so therefore, we have zero capacity. But I said, in reality, these were two rooms, and they were two rooms for all students when this was a school. So now you have four sections. But if I take one of the rooms and divide it in half for small group instruction, I can bring in another section. I lose that room, but now I have two small groups and three regular. Okay, so to that point, this is how Schrader did the capacity study. Each grade um, of those special ed rooms that have students occupying them during the majority of the day, uh, so they're not as pullouts, they are assigned capacity. Proposed capacity uses the same capacity derivation, however it differs in the planning team attempt to allocate relatively similar size spaces for the various support programs provided throughout the district. In that effort, the team did not, however, modify the quantity or type of learning support spaces that are currently allocated in the various buildings. So if a special ed class is in a large building, it stayed in the capacity study. If it was in a small, it stayed. Uh, the team recognized that the learning support and other support programs are developed individually per school based on that building's needs. How we have an example of that is that there are some schools that have little or no small or medium-sized classes. And we know that in education today, there are many myriad of different small group instructional spaces. There's um, math specialists, learning resource rooms, humanities, uh, all kinds of spaces that are not as big as regular education. And some of them are very small. Some of them only have a few kids in them. So um, when we look at trailers, the most challenging school to take trailers off is Newtown Middle. It has the most students in it. There are five trailers being used, two for health and three for world language. That is regular ed sections that could be 30 kids in a class. Yet when we look at the inventory of rooms at Newtown Middle, they have only large classrooms. They don't have any small. They certainly have resource rooms. They certainly have small group instruction, but we don't have small group instructional classrooms. So what I'm proposing is that we take small group uh, classrooms and uh, divide either divide classrooms to get them into appropriate sizes. I don't want to squeeze them in, but appropriate sizes for their number. Or we have to take the teachers that are in the trailers and put them into the empty classrooms when they're available. And in a middle school, there's an empty classroom. Every classroom is empty for two periods of a day, at least. Then when we also look at um, schools that have no small classrooms, one of them is Holland. And we just spent $20 um, million on that school. Holland Elementary has um, one medium-sized classroom, all the rest are large. So in the capacity study that Schrader did, um, he, can, he said the existing capacity, the enrollment here is 338, the existing capacity is 408, and that in a proposal could go to 542. And that is done in part by dividing classrooms. Um, then we look at two, room, two classrooms that schools that are relatively the same square footage and, relative, and the same amount of classrooms. Churchville has 81,700 square foot. Newtown Elementary has 83,000. Both have 42 classrooms. Churchville only has three medium-sized classrooms. Newtown Elementary has two medium 
and six small classrooms. So for a total of eight small group instructional spaces. So in the Schrader study, the church role uh, capacity is 727 and Newtown 764. And if you divide Newtown up a little bit more in the proposal, Newtown goes to 870. So you have it there, it's in the documents. I just want to open your eyes to be looking at sizes, how schools are used. You don't just want to, I mean, this point is certainly said in the charge to the committee that they want the trailers off. And it seems like some board members also want schools closed. In order to close the schools, you're going to have to utilize the space that you have in an efficient way, and you're going to have to look at dividing classrooms to increase capacities, and then you'll be able to close them. Thank you. Kevin Campbell, uh, Dispatch Drive. One of the things um, I want to thank the board for being part of this process has uh, opened my eyes to a lot of different things. One of the things that I'm very concerned of, and as we look, go down the road with building a new school at projected cost of $55 million, are, is reading the national averages across the country for schools of that size coming in at averages of $30 million. That's a pretty big difference. If you take a comparison to a New York school that was built in the city, a six-story building that came in at $66 million, you know, that, that's... Those are numbers that we're, we're right up there with a New York school that was built six stories, and we're projecting or, or proposing a $55 million middle school. I really think we need to look at how much we're putting into a school of that size, similarly across the country, and, and when we look at it, see what we're getting for that, and if we can drop that down to where the averages might be, I think we might have a better um, take on the community when we look at it. It doesn't have to be the Taj Mahal. It has to be something that we are, we are instilling our, our children in for the future and is sustainable for years to come. But it doesn't have to have a price tag of the most expensive out there. And, and the industry magazines that I've been exposed to recently, we are trending at the very high end of those as far as I can tell. So uh, Doug and I will surely have conversations in months to come because uh, he doesn't know it yet, but he just found a new facilities member that I'm going to be coming to more of these meetings thanks to this uh, learning experience. But we really do need to look at the numbers, tighten the belts, and, and, and continue the process with everybody's input. I thank you for the experience, and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. It's been a long evening. I'll see you all next Thursday. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Yeah, look at that.